Let us remain standing just a moment for prayer. Dear God, we thank Thee tonight for first for Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank Thee because that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank Thee for people who believe that. We're so glad that we have a God, not just an imaginary God, an imaginary idol, an imaginary spirit. There's nothing imaginary about it. A true and living God who lives with us and in us and works through us. Not making a statue to God, but we being living images of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit not speaking through a statue, but st- speaking through a redeemed vessel. God manifested in flesh. How we thank Thee for this. The great pillar of fire following us, or are we following it, rather? And for all the great manifestations of the same Spirit doing the same work that it's always done when it comes to the earth. What a consolation it gives us. We have assembled tonight, Lord, for no other purpose but to know how and to learn how, by thy help, to be better Christians and better fit subjects for this hour that we're approaching. Won't you help us, Lord? We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. May be seated. With about another 30 or 40 questions, I, I don't know how I'd ever get to them. I tried hard this afternoon to see if I could even get them down to normal, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I want to say that I'm going to do the very best that I can to, to answer these questions because they're fine questions coming from the hearts of Christians. And I, I certainly want to do everything that I know how to answer them just as sensibly as I know how to answer them. And I, I want to thank the Lord for how He's helped this morning in helping us to, to get a hold of these questions and, to, and to, the answers that He did give us. Now, I've just got them all in here mixed up, I guess, 150 more. And we got to about 20, I guess, this morning. And, um, and so now, before we start, I would just like to say that if anybody wanted to see this article on um, a church rock as the drums roll the Presbyterian minister here um, uh, leading his congregation in rock and roll a program uh, uh, for the for the sacrament let me just see just a minute youthful members swing out to jazz jazz passion play tells of the crucifixion in modern IDIOM rock and roll <laughs> the pastor here leading all the teenagers up there and going through the passions of Christ, the crucifixion, played out in rock and roll and jazz. Well, it's in Maryland. Now, isn't that something? And then here is the picture of those, uh, I was telling you this morning, of those Beatles. The return of Beatles. And there's the Articles, you just should read it out of the magazine and all of the different things as it were had founded a new religion. Now, their manager, I've got a note out of the paper here. You haven't got time. If anybody wants to read these, I can put them on the bulletin board. Then you can read them. And I just want to show you the hour that we're living in. It's shocking. You might not understand it, but people try to understand it, that what these things are. I've asked Brother Caps, he's got a good education and can read better than I. I've asked him to read this article from the manager of the Beatles. Can you do it, Brother Caps? States that the Beatles wonder about themselves and draw no answers. It's incredible, absolutely incredible, says Derek Taylor, the Beatles press officer. Here are these four boys from Liverpool. They're rude, they're profane, they're vulgar, and they've taken over the world, it's as if they'd founded a new religion. They're completely anti-Christ. I mean, I'm anti-Christ as well, but they're so anti-Christ they shock me, which isn't an easy thing. But I'm obsessed with them. Isn't everybody? I'm obsessed with their honesty, and the people who like them most are the people who should be outraged most. In Australia, for example, each time we'd arrive at an airport, 
It was as if de Gaulle had landed, or better yet, the Messiah. The routes were lined solid. Cripples threw away their sticks. Sick people rushed up to the car as if a touch from one of the boys would make them well again. Old women stood watching with their grandchildren as we'd pass by. I could see the look on their faces. It was as if some Savior had arrived and all these people were happy and relieved, as if things somehow were going to be better now. Taylor paused and stuck a cigarette in his mouth. The only thing left for the Beatles, he said, is to go on a healing tour. Isn't that what he said? Many shall come to me in that day and say, Lord, have not I seen? Now, can't you see that you can't put your trust in healing campaigns? You can't put your trust in any kind of a sign like that. The only thing you can put your trust in is, Thus saith the Lord from the Bible. A church that is exactly where I have tried to keep you, my children. And if something happens to me, and God takes me out of this earth, don't you never fail. Remember this with all your heart. Stay with that word. Don't you leave that word. Anything contrary to it, leave it alone. No matter what it is, then you know it's right. A healing campaign now. Sinful man that even shocked their own managers with their vulgar and dirt and filth. And people throw away their crutches and get healed by looking at these boys. It's so filthy and dirty and antichrist. You see, it's Satan on a mock campaign. See, he does anything that the Christ can do, but he can't confirm the word. Amen. He'll take part of it here and part of it here, but he can't take it all together. See, he can't get it together. So you see, no wonder the Bible said that it would almost fool the very elected if it was possible. The Antichrist spirit. Now, even their own press manager here, press agent, he's for them believes in him, and said he's possessed of the same thing because they've won him over. Them evil things. And now, don't you see, women, why I am trying to tell you about this short-wearing, hair-cutting, bobbing, and things? It's a spirit. It is a spirit. Here it is right in our leading magazines and everything of what's showing out rock and roll and stuff in a church. Why, it's a setup exactly for Satan. And there's still churches and denominations. Back to the Word, children, as fast as you can go. Don't you dare to leave it. You stay right with that Word. See how that Antichrist spirit, it can speak in tongues, it can show signs and wonders, it can heal the sick, it can do all these things. See, them people thinking they're approaching God, them boys are God sent because the church has let down on the Word. Those boys belong to church. Elvis Presley is a Pentecostal. Pat Boone is a Church of Christ. Look at them guys. Pentecostals, Church of Christ, and all those like that with them evil spirits on them. Red Foley, a golden voice. Church of Christ. Sing the religious songs like nobody can sing them and rock and roll in the next voice. By their fruits you know them. Look what churches they belong to. Elvis Presley and members of the Assemblies of God. There you are. Each one of them wanted that, and Satan gave it to them. Don't you see, uh, friends, how? Don't let loose of that word. See, it's a spirit that gets on you. Now, I tell these women, when they make themselves look sexy in these dresses, that God's going to make you answer for committing adultery? If you believe me to be what you say, God's servant, a prophet, listen to what I'm telling you. See, you might not be able to understand it, and if you can't, then you just do what I tell you to do. God will hold me responsible for what I say. See? You listen real close, and remember that those things are spirit. Ordinarily, maybe the person don't... You remember God covered with skin I preached on not long ago? See? The God with skin on it? Now, just remember, some of us are sent to this world to break into these rims to tell us these things. Amen. See, 
It's the foreknowledge. It's God speaking, showing when you judge anything by the flesh, why they're innocent. Look here. Fine people, honest, wouldn't tell you a lie or nothing. And the whole thing is the devil. Religious. Even starting a healing campaign. See? Uh, just exactly Antichrist. See? That's Presbyterian and all that. You see them denominations, how they do, writing the same thing. Well, here in London, England, just recently, they had a rock and roll team to impersonate Christ and Judas and all that. And uh, they call Christ Daddy-O and talk to all those cri- uh, words them crazy kids talk. See? The teenage kids talk over the world. Now, you know that the Bible predicts that? Amen. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affections, truce breakers, false accusers, disobedient to parents, teenage taking over the world, and it's done it. I went into a place the other day, I was playing this one of these old dirty jukeboxes, all that stuff. I didn't even want to take my family. I said to that lady, how much does them records cost? Ten cents a piece. How many will it play in an hour? She told me. I said, here's the money, unplug it. Well, she said, I couldn't do that. Them kids come in here to play that. Then I couldn't spend no money there. I went somewhere else. See? Well, that stuff that make you nervous, you'd have to uh, go down and get a bunch of tranquilizers to say <laughs> after hearing the crazy stuff. <laughs> that just irks a Christian. If you like that kind of stuff, you know what's wrong with you? You need to get saved. Because what's in you is feeding on something besides the Word. It's feeding on... You couldn't imagine Jesus doing a thing like that, could you? Could you imagine one of the prophets doing such a thing? Don't you see, fans? The whole thing all over is the devil. And the Bible said how he would come in form of religion and just do just exactly like the Christ. See? But the only way you'll ever be able to tell is not join this church or join that church is stay with the Word. He is the Word. Now, the Lord bless you each. We're going right straight to the questions. And now for about till about an hour and 15 minutes, I'll not be able to get through all these questions. They're just piles of them. I think they're good questions. They're very fine. I'll just reach down and pick out one here and there as I go along. And now, answer it. To, I, would, I thought tonight, I'd just come down, let somebody read them, say yes or no. Yes or no on that isn't doing the people just. They ask those questions to have them answered. And I, I wouldn't do that because... I'll get what I can. What I can't, I'll get the next time around. And yeah. now, I, I, about next Sunday, I don't know. I tell you, if you get a hold of Billy sometime between now and Wednesday, we may have to leave. Now, here's one thing. I'm way behind in the interviews. Billy showed me a pile of interviews that high. It's been waiting some of them for months. Well, while I'm in, I've got to catch some of those, catch some of the media, do everything I can to kind of balance it up. I'm going to pray this week while I'm gone. And ask the Lord, what would He have me do? Finish up these or, or take the interviews. If I take the interviews, then I'll just run, come home on Sunday and run the interviews right through somewhere and go right on through the day with interviews. And if I don't, well, I'll have to put the interviews off till I'm back again. If I don't, then I'll answer. I'll, Billy will send you a card. And I'll tell you, it's nice, these dear kids, to tell you how they like one another. The love they have for one another. One will tell the other, and the other will tell the other. Billy just calls one in a section of about 150 miles, and the rest of them gets the whole the rest of them. <laughs> they love one another. They don't want to miss anything. They want to be here at every minute to see what goes on. For if the Lord should give something, they want to be here to receive it. Amen. And I appreciate them. I remember, dear friends, this morning, I made a statement on some of the questions, and I noticed some of these I yet got in this morning is more about... People moving out to Arizona. See? I thought I would better make that clear so that you'd understand. Now, don't, don't think that I'm trying to tell people that where they can live and what they can do. And I, I'm not saying that, my dear brother. There's honest people that wants to move out there. Well, anybody that wants to move. I'd sure be, be glad as long as I'm there, which as much as I'm there, I'm here about ten times what I am there. I've got... Between now and Christmas, i got about four days to be there. Then immediately after that, I'll leave for overseas. I'll be here at the tabernacle maybe two or three weeks before I go overseas in a, a revival as I usually do this spring. And then from there, I've only got one meeting in all Arizona, and that comes off in January at Phoenix two nights with a Christian businessman. The, I don't, if the people out there... Um, 
Could you flip that tape? Now, as we're starting in on these uh, questions tonight, I'll pick up one here. And are you enjoying them? Say amen. amen. I think it's profitable for us at this time. Oh, I believe shortly at looking uh, this morning before coming down here at some, some texts and some places in the Bible, I thought, oh, what a wonderful thing it would be while we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. What a wonderful thing it would be to take back to all those Old Testament characters through Job and through there and run series of meetings on them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. Just to show how they type right into the day the whole word ties together and all about the destructions of the, and the ancient times and how they uh, type up with the day. How everything in the Old Testament speaks of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, first question I pulled out of here. Brother Branham, is it wrong for a Christian to put to put her hair in pin curls? Also, what length should her sleeves be? Thank you, a sister. Um, now that means a whole lot to that woman. Now to some of us brothers, we might think, "Oh, this silly woman," but well, it's not silly to her. She wants to know. Now about putting hair in. Uh, what was it? Pigtails or something? Another. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I, I, I'm sorry. Pin curls. Excuse me. Pin pigtails. That's what the girls used to wear years ago. You remember? Kind of, wasn't that right? They call them pigtails. Just kind of curls hang down. No. Pin curls. Excuse me, friends. Um, uh, what length sleeves should she wear? I, I don't think that it is anything about that. I don't know. See, what I can't back up the Bible, I, I don't want to say much about it. Now, I'm just telling you this for me, because I have no scripture to back this up. The only thing I have for the ladies about their hair is not to cut it. How they want to wear it, that's up to them. And about the pin curls, actually, I don't know what they are, unless it's these things look like clothes pins that they stick in their hair. It's about the, the only thing that I know. And the lengths of sleeves, I think being a Christian... God will tell you what to do about those things, you see. I believe as a Christian person, you'd, you'd know about how to do that. I don't think God cuts any certain lengths or whatever it is. As long as you're decent and look honorable and clean, I, I think that's all right, don't you? See, now that's just my opinion. Now this is me, see, because I can't back nothing else up with the Scripture. I believe this morning the question came up about uh, 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 painting the hair, you know, with a with a color. Now, I, I, if, uh, I, I can't say anything about that. I don't know. But I, I, I have no scripture to say not to, to color your hair. Uh, that's, that's, oh, you women, you like to look nice and you should look nice. And Brother Bram's not against you children. You're my children. I, I, I love you. And I, I don't want to be bawling you out. I, I wouldn't do it for nothing. I'm only trying to help you. But now look, let me just ask, let me say this in answer to that question. I, are you ready? And to you on the tape, here it is, sisters. If there is a question in it, don't do it. But if you're, if you're filled with God's Spirit and led to go do it, as long as it don't interfere with the Scripture and don't interfere with a question, you're perfectly satisfied that that's the will of the Lord. Then go ahead and do it. See? Because there's no Scripture to say no. See about it. I don't, don't say nothing like that in the Bible. I know Isaiah 5, I believe it is, talk about women, how they would wear a changeable apparel and everything like that. But that was pride and stuff. Hold on. If you do that for pride, then it's wrong, see? Examine your heart before God. If there's no Scripture for it and the way the Spirit leads you, you go ahead and do it. But now when it comes to whether you should have long hair or short hair, you have long hair. That's the Bible. And there's a question here. I, I might answer it right now. It's in here. I've seen it this morning or sometime. It said, you're always harping about women how they mustn't uh, wear their hair, but you never say nothing about the man. If I seen a man come in here with long hair hanging down his back like a woman, I'd say, Mister, why don't you go to the barber shop? You look like a woman. See? But men usually don't do that. Not as man, now not as the infallibility of man. They're just as guilty as a woman. And by the way, a man that'll let his wife do that, he's guilty double of it. Because he's supposed to be the one that 
as a say-so in the house. And that man can't even rule his own house. How could he do it in the house of God? I'm so thankful for our group of women that we have coming here. I say this with respect and love. And I, God knows this is the truth. I, I used to have a preacher friend down south that had one of the cleanest looking churches I ever seen. we come to women, most beautiful women I ever seen, sat there saintly, godly, with long hair. And I always admired going to that church. And the Lord Jesus has given me a church today here that outshines that in a hundred miles. Amen. My women. I'm not scolding you to be mean. I'm only so happy for you. I just don't want Satan to get a foot in anywhere. <laughs> See, I want you to move upward, not backward. Don't never let no man deceive you by some en- enchantments or something other like that or something saying, oh, well, I don't. See, that's the way Satan interpreted the word to Eve. See? You believe just what the word says. All right. Very urgent. Brother Branham, knowing that time is ending and eternity setting in, what would be your advice for a couple planning marriage? Go right ahead and get married. See? Go right on just like if you just go to live for another hundred years here on earth. Just go right on. Keep your heart set on Christ. Not your hearts on these things of the world, but on Christ. See? Go right on. Get married, children. God bless you in your weddings. Dear Brother Branham, I have been baptized in Jesus' name. The Word says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Does this, uh, does this mean the baptism, the Holy Spirit, or does it mean I should receive the gift? Definite, should you receive a definite experience with the baptism? I am anxious to be to be um, filled with the, the Spirit. Please excuse the long note as I have been wanting to ask you this question for a long time. Thank you. And the um, person has her names signed. They're out-of-town people. Now, there's a good question. Now, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is a definite experience that a person must receive. Now, let me kind of clear that up just for a minute, see. Now, many people have the, um, the idea, I believe, is twisted. And maybe right here to the church and to the church that's listening, there might be a question. Now, when I speak of not believing the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost is speaking with tongues, uh, I do not accept that. I believe uh, with God's help, I can prove it in the Bible that that's wrong. See? Because the speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Ghost. How many knows that? Yes. Divine healing is a gift of the Holy Ghost. And here beetles are doing it. Mm-hmm. See? Yes. Satan can impersonate any of those gifts. Witches, wizards can speak in tongues and interpret it. The jungle lands. Many times a wizard will speak in tongues, drink blood out of a human skull, and interpret unknown tongues. Out in Arizona, when they have the old festival dance of the corn dance, the Indians wrap these bull snakes around them when they're trying to pray to God to send them rain for their corn. They call it the corn dance. They take the tassel of the corn, place it around them, and make a little clout, and they dance. And the witch doctor comes out with horns on his head, buffalo horns, and they dance with these bull snakes around them. And the wizards and many of the pipe smokers and things around the place, they won't let a white man around at that time. But I've watched them through binoculars and have Indian friends who went to their dances. That's the ones that not Christians, of course. And they dance this corn dance holding these snakes. And the wizard comes out and cuts himself with knives and everything else. And finally they get into the Spirit and speak in tongues and interpret it. I have, could take you right within three or four hours from now where a medium will lay a pencil on the table and go into a trance and all kinds of things and wave their hands. And that pencil will raise up and write in unknown tongues. And the wizard will stand and tell you what it says. Now that's no evidence of the Holy Ghost. You can't rely upon that. 
You can't rely upon the fruit of the Spirit because the first fruit of the Spirit is love and the Christian science exercise more love than anybody I know of and they even deny Jesus Christ being divine. See? There's only one evidence of the Holy Spirit that I know of and that is a genuine faith in the promised word of the hour. Now those Jews come, they had more religion than the disciples had. They were better trained men in the Scriptures than the disciples was because they were fishermen, tax collectors, and so forth. And they had real faith and genuine faith in what they were doing. Now listen closely. Now I don't miss this, see. When it comes to being fruits of the Spirit, kind and gentle, I guess there wasn't a one of those priests but what could outshine Jesus Christ in it. He went to the temple, plaited ropes, looked up on them with anger, and turned over the tables and run them out of the place. Is that right? The Bible said he looked upon them with anger. The Bible said that. Exactly right. So you see, those priests were gentle, meek, understanding man. When it comes to the fruits of the Spirit, they could show more fruits of the Spirit than Jesus ever could. When it comes to theology, they didn't have a school that he come out of. Whence cometh this man? Where did he come from? What fellowship card does he have? What organization does he belong to? We don't know where he come from. He was just absolutely an outcast guy that was born to illegitimate birth. While we could down him here in a few minutes and show you by the laws, they had a right to do what they did when it come to that. Why? Because they failed to see that he was that promise word of the hour. Amen. The only way they recognized it when Jesus performed the word by being able to tell them what they had in their hearts, what they had been doing, he was a prophet according to the Word of God. What he said come to pass every word, word by word. He was God's prophet, servant. God the prophet. Not it was what was before there, the prophet of God, and this is God the prophet. Amen. Not the prophet of God. That was Malachi, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, and Elijah, and so forth. But this was God the prophet. Amen. Amen. Not the prophet of God. Amen. You get it now? Amen. All the prophets that portrayed his life in potions played their part, but in him was the fullness of all the prophets. Amen. The prophets, the word of the Lord came to them, the prophets, but this was the word and the prophet, the same person. Mm -hmm. See? Now, now, when a man receives Christ in the manner that he is in, you can't accept it as being... Uh, see, now some of them say, well, I'm a Lutheran. Well, there's nothing against that. But the eagles don't feed on that. See, that was as far as it was. That was fresh food of that day. I'm a Wesleyan. That's all right. But you're living in the past. Amen. See? Now, those people said, well, we have Abraham unto our father. That prophet said, God's able these stones to rise children to Abraham. Amen. Amen. We belong to this. We belong to that. That had nothing. He said, you generation of snakes. Who's warned you to flee from the wrath? Don't begin to say we have Abraham to our father because God's able to these stones to rise children to Abraham. See? So being a well-trained theologian had nothing to do with it. Being meek and gentle had nothing to do with it. What made him different? He was the Word made flesh. Amen. Not the Word for the day of Moses. Moses was that day word. Not the word for the days of Noah. Noah was the word for that day. Not the day the word for the day of Elijah. Elijah was that word for that day. Amen. But he was the present tense word. Amen. And they were living in the back. Yes. The same thing repeats. Amen. Yes. Right. That's the evidence of the Holy Ghost. When God reveals to you and you see it. Thus saith the Lord, and accept it. Not what you are, what you was, or nothing about it. It's what God has done for you now. Amen. There's the evidence. Jesus said, He gave us the evidence of the Holy Ghost. John 14. He said, I have many things to tell you. I haven't got time to do it. But when the Holy Ghost comes... He will tell you, bring to your memory, 
the things that I told you about and will also show you things that is to come. Don't you see? There's the evidence. That's foretelling and being having the divine interpretation of the written word. Now, isn't that the evidence of a prophet? A seer in the Bible was a man that could foretell and be perfectly exactly. Not somebody laid hands on him. That's a gift. A prophet is predestinated and born to be a prophet. See? All the whole life it was a prophet. That's the office. That's where the people who made the questions here on, well, will the bride, will this, the church. And the, see, you, you can't uh, divide what they are. The bride is the elected of God. The church goes through, that's the ones that says, whosoever will, let him come. But the bride is the elected of God. There is five offices elected of God. For God has set in the church. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. God did that. Man has deacons and so forth and everything else. But you see, but God set in the church for the perfecting of the church. Can't divide it. Now the Holy Spirit, when it comes, it is a witness unto you. See? That this word is right. The word for today, not the word for Luther. The word not for Moses. We witness it's the truth. But it's another day. Now what if Jesus had come and said, Now, as Moses come taking you all out of Egypt, I've come taking you somewhere else. What if he said, Let's go to work and build an ark. I, I'm the Lord God. I, I'm going to float the world away now. I'm going to drown the world, all of them. Why, well, he had been out of the... See, the Scripture never said he'd come like that. See, he wouldn't have been the Messiah. No matter how much ark he'd built or whatever he'd done, he's still not... He'd have not qualified the Messiah. Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. There you are! It's qualification! Yes, Amen. yes sir. First Corinthians 13 says this, When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. So all these little things of jumping up and down like a kid trying to talk in tongues and all these other things, when that which is perfect, and we do have today by God's help the perfect interpretation of the Word with divine vindication. Then that which is in part is done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. But when I become a man, I put away childish things. Amen. Amen. I go to preach and I don't get to these things. Hallelujah. Brother Branham, did I finish them? Did I get about the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Yes, that was about, wasn't it? Right. Excuse me. If I don't get it, just forgive me. I, these are such wonderful questions. You could just stay uh, one whole night just on one question. Brother, and then not even touch it. I appreciate you as a servant of God. The believe, and I believe the message of truth. My wife won't hear me. Says anything, say anything about this message. And will not listen to any tape. I am in nervous uh, trouble on my job also. I want my wife to believe to and pray for my children. Brother Branham, I want to be friend of God's. I want to be found in God's will for my life. I want to be His servant. And the person signs over. Wait a minute. When I was small, I told everyone that I wanted to be a preacher. I don't know what God wants me to do. I'm willing to do anything for the Lord. Yours in the Lord. Now, a good question. And a man that's sincere, his wife, his companion, that's a part of him. May I add something here to that? My brethren, I say this in the name of the Lord. One of these days, the Lord willing, I think He'll just go ahead and make that tape on marriage and divorce. See? Bring it right here to the tabernacle. If it separates, it'll just have to separate. But we're going to prove it's the word of the Lord. Amen. 
Look, my brethren, listen to this. Do you know many times you get the wrong mate here in the earth? Some pretty pair of brown or blue or gray eyes bumps you into a place that you, that you shouldn't have listened. Many man realizes that. A man getting married should first approach it prayerfully. You should not pick a woman by being beautiful on the outside, but beautiful on the inside. One that will be a mother to your children. I know this is going to sound awful for a minister to say this at the pulpit, but I used to go with, with buyers of cattle. When in the West, we'd buy breeder cattle, and they want to start a herd. And I learned a whole lot there that while I noticed those auctioneers and the things they were doing, those buyers... I used to go with an old fellow come here to church with me and I led to Christ, a perfect infidel to begin with, Mr. Jeffries, many of you remember him, a rancher out of Colorado. We'd go and they'd come into a cow. I seen a little breeder calf one day sell for $11,000, just a small calf. She had never been bred yet. And I said, and Jeff said, if I had the money, I'd place it in that calf. And I thought, now he's a rancher. He understands his business. I said, Jeff, why would you? What is the qualification? She's a Hereford. That was sold a while ago for $300. To me, it looked like a bigger calf and everything. He said, look, Billy, there's one thing you do not understand in cattle buying. He said, I think you ought to hold to your road preaching. <laughs> but said, you don't understand cattle. He said, now look at that calf down there. We walked down there. He said, see that wild stare in her eyes? I said, yeah. He said, her children and her grandchildren and her great-great-grandchildren still have that wild stare. And said they'll run themselves poor. They'll never be a mother to their calves. And said you never could fatten them. They'll never make beef. He said, look at this little calf here at soul. Look how gentle she looks. Look at that peaceful look in her face. That kind look. No stare in her eyes. Said she'll be a real mammy to her calf, and her calf's calf and calf's calf will continue to be that way. And said they'll all of them be mammies if they can get the right kind of a breeder bull to that calf. See? That'll make their children. But that starey look in the face will always make a poor herd of cattle if a man's trying to buy cattle. I said, yes, sir, thank you. And the same thing applies by women. You take one of them painted face and starey eyes and look like some kind of an animal Amen. trying to disfigure herself from a human being, she'll never make anything. She'll run all the time. And Christianity is not beauty on the outside, it's on the inside. Amen. A peace, quiet, adorn themselves in a peaceful, quiet spirit, which is a great price before the Lord. That's what we want to look for on women. And on man, and whoever it is. Now, uh, Brother Branham questions should a Christian woman wear simple jewelry as necklaces or pearls? Well, a sister, I know this means a lot to you, and it means a lot for me for you to place your confidence, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> now, remember. The Bible said, when you adorn, do not adorn with, with costly jewels and pearls and all kinds of wearing of jewelry, but let that be the adorning of a peace and quiet and meek spirit, which I just quoted, which is a great price before the Lord. Now, I don't mean by that, sister, that if you had a pin, now, this is me, not the Lord. If you had a pin that you wanted to wear or a little necklace your husband gave you, or maybe you're uh, something like that that you wore. Now, to me, I don't think that's bad. Now, that's just me. I remember I make myself clear that's my opinion. But I think it's the approach to it. It's the way you do it. See? It's the motive behind it. And when you see it's getting a hold of you, then leave the thing alone. But I think if you wore your wedding ring, I know you Nazarene people... It used to be that you wouldn't even baptize a woman with a wedding ring on. See? I, I don't believe that. It's necessary. In the Bible, they wore wedding rings. Well, it was a tablet, they called it, around their head. Nine pieces of coin in it. But I, uh, to show they were married. Now, I think that's all right. If women want to dress and uh, make themselves 
uh, look decent, clean, ladylike? Well, I think there's not a thing to that, to me. But when you get to going to put that thing into making a little pride, then you're wrong. It's your attitude. Do you women remember here not long ago they had what they call scandal skirts? I think they're coming out again. Or they got worse be They're scandalous now instead of scandal. But they used to have a play back not long ago. They had uh, the girls, young women, and of course the old ones would do it too because they all want to be young. I don't mean you sisters. I mean the women of the world. And they'd cut their, their skirt up high, about a foot high, every time and wear some kind of an underneath garment, look pretty. And when they would make a step, it would uh, show this underneath garment, the lace and frills or whatever it was on it. Which, you know, um, there's a, a girl come to me, which is a Dunkard girl, had just received the Holy Ghost and she belonged to the Assemblies of God. And that was in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I was married at. And she come to me, a fine little lady, and she said, Brother Branham, I want to ask you a question. I said, all right, sister, what is it? She said, do you think it's wrong for a girl, to, a Christian girl to wear a scandal skirt? I said, sister, this is one thing I, I just can't understand. What is a scandal skirt? And she told me what it was. I, he said, it shows the underskirt. I said, what, what is in a woman that would make her want to show her underneath clothes to some man? What, would, what, what business has a Christian girl got doing a thing like that? Could you imagine a Christian? Now look, a man, there's not much to him when it comes to a body. And he, if he went half naked, it would, there wouldn't be no scandal to it. Not holding for man, but to... You know that what kind of a woman would be tempted by a man with his shirt off and shorts on or whatever he had? The big old burly looking thing. It looks sloppy and sickly. Uh, horrible. Amen. See these men out here. Well, I think it'd make a woman vomit to look at such a thing. If she had... But now you take a woman and put her like that. That's a different temple. You understand? All right. But I think as far as the necklace or now if you go to load yourself up like you went through the 10 cent store down here with a magnet on you, I, I think, uh, excuse that. I didn't mean to say that like that, but that that's wrong. If anything turned me the first time against, uh, made me ashamed of America was I was in Switzerland one day and Brother Oregon right now had found a good place way down by Lausanne where we get a big fine steak about so big around, weigh about a three quarters of a pound, I think for around 30 cents in American money. Oh, we were living like kings. Every day we go down there, and all of them there drink wine. You know, their water's no good. And I wouldn't drink that wine. So I got me a little jug from the uh, drugstore that had um, distilled water. And I packed that jug wherever I went. I guess everybody thought, that boy carries his own brand. So uh, I had it in my hand. We went down there to this place where all the selling these steaks. And one day, Miss America drove up. About a 28 model Chevy. Had a poodle dog sitting on the lamp. And brought that in there. And she had enough, them two women had enough 10 cents to her jewelry. Great big long things and earrings and hanging way down and paint. And both of them 50 years old, as old as me. And you thought they wanted to be 15. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to drive life's road looking through a rear view mirror. Looking back to what they used to be. Now, a Christian don't do that. A Christian don't try to be what he used to be. He's not looking where he's been. He's looking where he's going. Amen. Yeah. Amen. See? Don't pay no attention to what you was then. You've done live that out. You'll never return to it. That's in the past. And any man that drives life's road looking through a rear view mirror will go to wreck. And so will you on this Christian road. Don't look back what you was. Look what you're going to be. Paul said, forgetting those things which are in the past, I press towards the mark of the high calling. Now, but it made you a shame. They brought this little stinking dog in there and set it up on the table. Now, that would make anybody vomit. And fooling with that dog right there, set it up there with her hands and then go to eat with them same hands. And the waiter come over there, blabbed off something, Dr. Gookenbuehl's with me. He started laughing and turned his head. I said, what did he say? So the waiter said, take it off. They said, no, she's an American. Let her alone. In other words, she don't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
when I come to San Angelo at Rome, and I think of this at the Vatican, in Rome, Italy, they had a sign up at San Angelo to the American women before entering this catacomb, please put on clothes to honor the dead. The Catholic Church. See? Question. Brother Branham, where will the bride be when the earth explodes and burns up? Will it be in a place like the children of Israel were in Goshen when the plagues fell? Will the bride be on earth while this takes place? If so, where? And will the bride all be in one place at the time of the rapture? The bride is... When the earth explodes, the time of the rapture will be the awakening of the dead and the get-togethering of the living for, with the living for the rapture to take place. Now, but the bride, and I see one of them, is a rapture way back here before the millennium. And when the earth burns up, is back here after the millennium and after the white throne judgment. See? The saints will be camped upon the breath of the earth when Satan comes up around the beloved city and God rains fire and brimstone from heaven and destroys them. All right. Now that's Scripture. Also, Brother Branham, I believe a woman should be subject to her husband. But if a Christian woman has a sinner husband who does not even to one of your services, come to one of your services and, won't, and wants his wife to to be doing things, cutting her hair, wearing shorts, and going to ungodly places, is this woman supposed to be subject to this man in this way? Please explain this more clearly, as this is a question that is asked often. No, sister. You are not subject to such a person. No, indeed. For this cause... You'll leave everything and cleave to God. Now the thing, if you want that man wants to live with you, and you be, stay a Christian, but if he's going to make you wear shorts, cut your hair, and do all these other things in ungodly places, you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You're not bound to such a person as that. But as long the Bible says, as she is pleased and he is pleased to dwell together. You remember that? Let them, and now these, I didn't put the scriptures out because I just picked them up. You see, a few minutes ago, I pick up one now and then that I haven't got time. But Paul said that as long as the unbelieving husband has an unbelieving or a believing wife or so forth, let the believing wife remain with the believing husband as long as it's not contrary now to God. If he's pleased to dwell with her, go ahead, honey. If you want to go to church, that's all right, but I ain't going. I don't believe in it. I don't have nothing to do with it. But you go ahead, that's all right. But when he says you can't do it, there's a different thing. You're not bound to that then. You separate everything for God. Brother Branham, is it, let's see, for a person who has a, who has a living divorce mate who remarry before coming unto the message to minister? Well, in 1 Timothy 3, 2, if you want to put that down, and Titus 1 to 6, I wrote that one down. I want you to read that for this question, see. If a man, if a man desires the office of a bishop or a preacher or something other in church, he's got to have just one wife. That's right. A minister. Now, that's 1 Timothy 3, 2, and Titus 1 to 6. Now, uh, Titus 1 to 6. Yeah. All right. Now, notice that the Bible said that that man that's a minister in the house of God will have one wife. Now, dear Brother Branham, approximately 10 years ago, God met me now and healed what the gift of love, or revealed what the gift of love was, and same. Then my prayer is for that I will return. Will I receive it before I die? Will my husband hear the word and what am I to do? That's more of a question. Now she said, now what it is here, or 
she said my husband, so I suppose it would have to be the woman that said this. Now, she lost her first love. See? She, she got cold in the Spirit. Now, sister, maybe because you still come to church and do what's right, you haven't lost your salvation, but you've lost the joy of your salvation. David cried to the Lord one time, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. You still are a Christian, but I, what you want to do, sister, is turn loose of everything that you know how and seek God and pray. Will my husband hear the word, and what am I to do? As I said this morning, just be salty. Ye are the salt of the earth. Your husband will watch your chaste life, and the husband that's an unbeliever will be sanctified to the Lord by the believing wife. Just seek the Lord, stay humble, and pray all the time, giving God praise and being kind to your husband as long as he's willing to live with you that way. For Sunday services, if a woman commits a wrong with a... Now, wait a minute. I better read this verse to myself. To see. But the married man repents and makes it right according to his need to wife and man involved even if his wife has been... I, sorry. If a woman commits a wrong with a, a married man repents and makes it right with her husband according to the scriptures does she need to go to the wife of the man involved even if this wife doesn't know anything of it or is it the man's duty to tell her first or does she need to be hurt at all how far can we go with this restitution when it is over and done, and when friendship is involved. Well, my dear sister, there's only one thing that you have done, which is right. You was involved, I guess, or somebody that you know of was involved in a wrong act that you taken another woman's companion and had a social act. And when you did... There you fell from your grace. Then you repented, and you could not repent until you go back to this man and make it right. You've got to take your husband and go to that man, which you did, and that was the thing you should have done. That's Scripture. You should have done. A lady come to me not long ago from right here in Louisville. That she's a young woman. She run with a man, and, um, and then she, she knows she's doing wrong, and she left the city and went to another city way away and changed her name, lived with some people. And this man followed her and told her when he got over there, he had the goods on her. She would still have to remain to being a common-law wife to him, or he would tell. And when she was over there, she got married to a fine Christian man and said if she didn't, he would explode the whole thing, threatened her. Therefore, she had to live with both men, which she'd done wrong instead of showing her colors at the beginning. And she had a baby, and now the girl's about 18 years old and don't know which one of them really is her father. Now she comes into menopause and is caught up with her. Now what can she do? I said, he's only one. She said, if I tell my husband, he'll leave me. And if I, my daughter knows it, she'll commit suicide. Now I said, if you hold it in your heart, you'll go to hell. Now suit yourself. You know, one thing to do is clean your slate. Exactly right. Be honest. You know, many times... In the visions, how the people come, women and men, the Holy Spirit digs up them things that they've done down in life. You've heard of it and you've seen it and, thing, and tell them things that they've got to do it. They say, well, I, I, I've already made it right with the Lord, but you owe it to your husband or to your wife to go tell them. It's right. You're supposed to confess that. Now, this person, if she is the one that's guilty, she has did it. She went to her husband. Now, you cleared yourself, sister, because between you, you committed adultery against your husband. You went to your husband and cleared yourself to your husband. Then you went to the man and the husband and cleared yourself there. You are clear. If your husband continues to bless, the, want to live with you, that's up to him. He don't have to do it now. But he... Um, but if he wants to live with you and forgives you, then you be lady enough to never be guilty of such a thing again. But if he doesn't forgive you, then that's his, that's his own business. He can put you away. Exactly right. But now the man that you had to act with, now he's the one's got to go to his wife and take his wife and come back to you. You've done your part. Now it's his time to do his part. See? The second party. This woman had the act with the man 
And she took her husband, confessed it, and went to the man and confessed it and made it right. Now the next man was a married man also. Now he's got to go to his wife and take the wife and come back to this wife. Then it's all right. See what I mean? It's made up then. But outside of that, you'll still be guilty and down in your heart you'll be condemned. I had a woman not long ago up there that had that since the First World War. And she said, oh, Brother Branham, she'd spent hundreds of dollars of psychiatrists and everything. I was sitting there watching her in a room. Needy brought her up there. She sat in there wringing a handkerchief through her hands like that. I said, I feel the world's going to burst. And I, all I guess, I just kept sitting there. I said, now there's something about, you got something in your life somewhere? No, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I said, all right. Sit there a little bit and watch. I said, I see a little green car. And you're with the blonde-headed man. And a train almost hits the car. She said, don't you tell nobody that. I said, your husband is in the army at the time. She started crying, jumped up. Don't you say that to nobody. See, that was way down in her subconscious. She said, I've confessed that to God a long ago. I said, but wait a minute. you never done a wrong against God. You've done a wrong against your marriage vow. You've got to go back to your husband and make that right first. She said, he'll leave me. I said, God has left you anyhow. So now, which one do you want to leave you? I said, go to him. And she said, oh, I, I, you do this. And I got two children. I said, well, that's all I can tell you. Psychiatrists never pull that out of you. But the Holy Spirit has revealed. I've never seen you in my life. She said, that's exactly right. She said, well, I, I just can't tell him. I said, well, I, glad I met you. Went on in the other room. And she come back in there. And me said, she wants you in there again. And I went there and I said, what do you want? And she said, Brother Branham, I can't tell that to my husband. And I said, your husband's a black-headed man. Yes. I said, he's got the same thing to confess to you. She said, oh, not my husband. I said, you better go get him and come here. I said, you know a certain woman that wears a pink dress that works in the office of a certain kind of automobile company? She said, sure. And I said, don't they call her a certain name? Yeah. I said, two weeks ago, they sat under a beech tree with, uh, sitting in a little brown Chevrolet car with license number so and so and was in the same act. Not my husband. I said, all right, you go get him and come here. She left a few minutes here to come back. He said, it's the truth. I, sa I said, you see, now go tell God. But first, when you come to the altar, remember there's ought. Go first and make that right. Yes. And as long as this other party here is guilty of not telling his wife... This wife has made herself clear. Now it's up to her and her husband. But this other man and his wife has to come clear in it. And you cannot, no matter what you do, it'll haunt you as long as you live until you wash it clean. There's only one way to do it. Confess it. If it takes the skin off of you, do it anyhow. Tell the truth. And you've got it right. Amen. I can hear plenty on the tape saying that's wrong. But you just try it one time and see if it isn't. All right. Question for Sunday morning. Sorry, it's this time, but at the instant of receiving the Holy Ghost or the baptism of the Holy Ghost, is there a difference? Does a person speak with tongues? If not, always, what manifestation is known? Well, could you... Imagine a mother giving birth to a baby and not knowing it. She'd have to be unconscious not to know it. Neither can you receive the Holy Ghost without knowing it. There's something takes place in you. See? There's something that changes you. Your whole system, your whole spiritual system is made new again. And you become a new creature in Christ. As the Bible puts it, a new creation in Christ. You know it. Now, you say, Brother Bram, then you don't believe that a man should speak with tongues to receive the Holy Ghost, not to prove he's got the Holy Ghost. I would that every member of my church spoke with tongues. I would like for him to do that. And if, I believe if you ask God, God will grant it to you. But let me tell you, I know plenty of people are speaking tongues and hasn't got the Holy Ghost. And there's not a minister is true with himself and with his congregation, but why I'll tell his congregation the same. The devil can impersonate that. Paul said, Though I speak with tongue of man and angels, 
Though I give my body to be burned as a sacrifice, though I understand all the mysteries of the Word, though I uh, give all my goods to the poor and all these things and have not charity, I still am nothing. I have faith that I can move mountains and so forth. I'm still nothing. Then he said, that which is in part will be done away with when that which is perfect is come. Or when that which is perfect is made known. Now, I've got a question on that. I hope we get to it tonight about what happened when the seals opened. And I think maybe that will get it right to you on this question. Um, question, Brother Branham, what shall we do? Something has settled over me that I cannot break through. Last fall, I dreamed I was lost in white sand. It was getting dark. I couldn't find my way. This dream has stayed with me since last fall. Now I am as one grouping in darkness. My son, E. R. V. Irvin, and wife were included in my dream. Now they are also in darkness. We are in a desperate. Uh, we are in desperation. I believe God will show you what is what is in our hearts now. Miss. Oh, all right. If we are wrong or sinning places, tell us. We want to be right. I don't know the lady. But I just feel if you're here, uh, lady, and here is your trouble, you have let something happen to you that's made you nervous. Because being in white sands represents purity and righteousness. And you're just letting Satan put one over on you. Your dream proved that there's nothing wrong. You're only nervous. And by doing this and thinking this, you're making the rest of your family nervous. Stop doing it. Claim your God-given rights. Your dream proves by the interpretation that you are in white sand. <laughs> Everything's all right. It's you yourself nervous. You let one member of the family get nervous, it goes to the next member, and the next member, and the first thing, you're all fussing and going on. And one member of the family gets kind of upset about something, it upsets the other, and the other, and the other, and the first thing, you know, the whole family's upset. It's Satan. Then if one member of the family rejoices, let the rest of them rejoice with it. So every one of the family, try to do that. Try each one of you children to help your papa, mama. Mama, you, papa, you try to help the children. Don't let that gloomy, unbelieving spirit get around you. You are Christians. You are born of the Spirit of God. You're the salt of the earth. You have God-given rights. And the Bible said, If there be any praise, if there be any virtue, think on these things. Amen. Don't think about the wrong thing. And sister, I think that's your trouble, sister dear. I could dwell on that a long time, but... According to what I promised, this 20 minutes, and I'd like to get this as many of these. If it ain't, put it back on the desk and I'll get it again. Some say Brother Branham is the Son of Man. I thought the pillar of fire was the Son of Man. Am I mistaken? Well, that's a good question. Very good. But I am not the Son of Man, but a Son of Man. There's quite a difference. Jesus Christ was the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of David. Now, the reason that question probably was asked this person or been said, because people regard me as a seer, which I have never, I've got a question in here, just blasting me on that, see? But I, uh, 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 you, you, when I read these questions, you'll see why I answer things the way I do until I am definitely led to do something. See? Then I, I say what I must say. But that hour hasn't arrived. So I am not the, the, the anointed son of man. I don't claim to be his prophet. Many times I've said it when I didn't think I said it. Catch myself on the tape. But I say that sometimes because if you want to give it in terms, a prophet is, in the English term, is merely a preacher. Anybody knows that? Get the dictionary. See? A prophet is a preacher under the English dictionary. But 
Under the Hebrew or the Greek, a prophet is a seer, one who foresees things and foretells things. But under the English uh, interpretation, a prophet is a seer. So I don't want to call myself anything but your brother. I am your brother, and you just regard me as Brother Bill or Brother Branham or whatever you want to do about that. that that's fine. That, that's any. What you believe, keep that to yourself, you see. And now, what was that other question? I get so wound up in these, I forget what the things were. Um, one of them was, was I the son of man? And um, here it is, I believe. The son of man, or was the pillar of fire the son of man? No, the pillar of fire is the anointing. The pillar of fire, now this may go a little deep, unless it's some of you theologians. Dr. Vale, probably brother here, and some of these ministers here from Arkansas, and uh, my good friends around, they'd probably know. Now, that pillar of fire is the Logos that went out of God. The Logos, which is actually the attribute of the fullness of God. When God become into a form to where it could be seen, it was the anointing of the great Spirit that went forth its condensing coming down. God the Father, the Logos, that was up over Israel, that He was holy, could not bear sin. There had to be a blood offering right in Eden. Then that Logos become flesh and dwelt among us. And where this Logos dwelt in a human body, which was a sacrifice, when man was made in the image of God, and then God came down in the image of man to redeem man, that brought man and God together. Heavens and earth hugged and kissed each other. God and man embraced each other as fatherhood and sonship. When the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus said, I came from God. And I go to God. Is that right? After His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, when the body was taken up to set at the right hand of God. Now, I don't mean God's got a right hand. God's a spirit. But at the right hand means in power and authority of God. That in that name, everything in heaven is named after it and subject to it. Everything in earth is named after it and subject to it. A name above all names. Jesus Christ. Now, this Logos that was in him, which was the Spirit of God, the anointing, through the sanctifying grace of the blood, brought many sons to God, which is anointed with this same Logos. Now, on the day of Pentecost, it come down that pillar of fire and broke apart like that, and tongues of fire set up on each of them. Not their tongues, but tongues of fire set up on each of them, a elected selected group identified by this pillar of fire showing that God had separated Himself into man. Do you get it? God, the Logos, separating Himself into man. God not in one person. He's in His church universal. That's the reason Jesus said, The works that I do shall you also more. Now, I know that King James says greater, but the right translation there is more than this shall you do. God was bottled and confined in one man, Jesus Christ. But now He's con bottled and confined in the whole universal church of the living God. Right now, while God is here speaking with us in our hearts, He's in Africa, He's in Asia, He's in Europe, He's in England. Wherever believers are gathered together, there He is in the midst of them. Now, after His death, burial, and ascension, and the coming of the Holy Ghost, Paul, on his road down, which was Saul to Damascus, he was struck down by a pillar of fire, the Logos. And that Jew would have never called that pillar of fire Lord unless he knew it was the same Logos that his people followed through the wilderness. See? Now, that was not the Son of Man. That was the Logos. Now, we say this with reverence and love and respect. See? As Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and also that in the last days, as it was before Lot's time, or in Lot's time in Sodom, so shall it be in the day that the Son of Man 
reveals himself again. Revealing himself. Now, in this last days, the Logos that was upon Jesus, which he has become from that back to the pillar of fire again, and has descended down on the earth to... Uh, I was going to say something, but I watched the tape. <laughs> they wouldn't believe that if you told them. It wouldn't make any difference. They, uh, people wouldn't believe it. But I'll admit that. But has come down for like an investigating judgment. Goes on. And now this great pillar of fire that's absolutely identified even by scientific cameras. And sure on the earth, there's a picture of it hanging there. I believe it's still there, isn't it right? Is it there? scientifically proven by the best we got George J. Lacey the head of the FBI for fingerprinting documents said I called it psychology myself Reverend Branham but said the light struck the lens I put it on her ultra ray lights and had examination here for four or five days and the light struck the lens and this lens won't take psychology Amen. now that's identified then watch the works of it it among us proves the same Jesus that once lived in Palestine. The same Spirit was up on Him as come up through a body until it's come back to headship again, which He's coming soon to claim the body. Amen. The head's coming to the body. You get it? That will be the Son of God. The Son of Man, the Son of David, the I Am, the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley, the Morning Star. I am not He. I am His servant. And the pillar of fire is not He. It's in spirit form. See? Which was upon the Son of Man and has come now to anoint sons of man to bring back a ministry just exactly like He said it would be in order for the head and the rest of the body to connect together. Just like the, like the pyramid as Enoch built. And we find in that pyramid they never did get the headstone on it. Why? The headstone's yet to come. The seven steps in the, in the pyramid. We'll go through that someday. And I'd just like to show you how it really is. Perfectly with the Scripture. And now, if you notice on your American dollar bill, that great headstone, an eye, says the great seal. It will come. And notice those stones. Was anybody here ever at the pyramids in Egypt? Well, if you notice there, there's hands there. It's up back there. All right. Those stones are laying in there so perfect. And that top, or the cupola like in the top of it, when that stone comes, it'll be like a great diamond fitting right down in there, just perfect with it. Now, that stone would not fit down there on that bottom foundation. Amen. Neither will it fit on the second foundation Amen. or the third foundation. It'll only fit on the top foundation when the entire building has become yes. fitted to the stone. Amen. And Jesus cannot come and tell a church, a body of believers in the ministry that He wants to will have to be the same as it was then. To, and then that brings... Them without us is not made perfect, Paul said, Hebrews 11. Without us they cannot be perfected. They must have this ministry to raise up the Lutheran Wesleys and all them down through their ages. When that come, when that part of the... For the eagles gathered. Just as the carcasses, the eagles will be gathered, the question was. Oh, it's just perfect. I hope that answers the question. Brother Benham, can Satan use a gift of tongues or prophecy in a person who has the Holy Ghost? That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. If It must be watched very, very close. If you'll notice in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, you won't spot it down. See? Little, the person that wrote this never signed their name just said, God bless you. See? In 1 Corinthians 14, 29, we find out that any gift in the church has got to be judged first. See? You have to watch because evil spirits slip in. Because remember, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. 
The same rain that was sent to ripen the wheat also ripens the weed. The same water. How many knows that? Now that ought to clear the serpent seed to you then. How did this sun come? I'm trying to pick it out here to get it before my time runs out, but I can't find it. So how that sun was about the serpent seed. See, God has a law. Now, on this, in this law of the spirit of life, you have to watch because Satan slips in. And Paul, when something was revealed to somebody, it had to have at least two or three judges before it could be told before the church. Now, also, and here I might bring this out. I see my, I don't think my brother's here tonight. But somebody made fun of somebody leaving the tabernacle and went down to Brother Junior Jackson's for a church. Said they went down amongst the dead birds. Aren't you ashamed to make a remark like that? Ever who you are, if you're my kid here in Christ, I'm ashamed of you. Don't do a thing like that. Junior Jackson is my brother. Don Ruddle is my brother. Well, the reason of it, because when I set the church here in a certain order, when I come back to see if I could get the manifestation of the gifts, half of them pulled away from it. Because when you would start to speak or preach or something, it got it was getting in such a place that you could hardly preach unless there was somebody spoken tongue, somebody turban, somebody give interpretation, and half of it never even come to pass. Now I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in interpretation. But it must be something directly to the church, not the Lord is coming soon or something, which is all right. But don't use vain repetitions, Jesus said, as heathens do. It must be something, go tell brother so-and-so a certain thing he done and, and to get, or go tell brother sister so-and-so when she did a certain thing down the other day, she transgressed the laws of her husband's, the vow to her husband. Unless she makes this lot right, the Holy Spirit will cut her off. There you've got, thus saith the Lord. Then bring that sin in. Amen. That's when we got a church like it was when Ananias and Sapphira come in. Uh, Lord. Then we got a church that stands solid. Oh, you say, Brother Bram, one guy told him that. He said, well, you put us too much on the spot. I said, ain't I on the spot up there? Amen. Amen. The strangers have never seen in my life. Right. But i got faith and confidence in my God who sent Amen. me to do this. And never one time has it been wrong or never will be Hallelujah. as long as it's God. Amen. Right. Not speaking in tongues and things like that. I believe that those tongues and people have got them gifts that they're real genuine Christians and interested in it. They'll meet themselves together because and give the tongues and interpretations and see what they can do to further the kingdom of God. they got a ministry of their own. But it don't belong here in the middle of the audience where the sinners are being dealt with and so forth. The Bible said they say you're unlearned. Sometimes they get so irreverent with it and, uh, and so forth. Not our gang hadn't. But I let them go ahead a while. I said, watch it. Now, I told the brother, and his witness is sure to know this. I said, let it alone. After a while, I'll sh- we'll find out whether it's of God or not. If it cannot stand chastisement, then it's a bastard child. Amen. That's exactly Amen. what the Bible said. Amen. And when the chastisement come, what happened? Amen. Did I tell you that long ago? Yeah. Hmm? That's the pastor here. He said, what about this and that? I said, just let it alone. They're babies. We can't judge it, but watch when it really comes to pin down to the Word. Amen. Now, Brother Junior Jackson had a right to disagree with that. He wants his church, the people all want to speak with tongues and things in the audience. That's Brother Junior's uh, troubles. That's, that's up to him. But Junior Jackson believes this message is the same as uh, and the rest of us does. He's one of us. And it's not a dead bird to go there. Junior Jackson is a man of God that I love with all my heart. Amen. That's not here tonight, Amen. so I can really pour it on the way I want to. And, and Don Ruddle, I don't think Don's here tonight because they got church of their own. But if I've seen every person come to this tabernacle, walk out and go to Don Ruddle or, or Brother J.T. Parnell or brother any of these brothers here that's our brothers here and fellow citizens of the kingdom, I'd be so happy I wouldn't know what to do. I'd say, Lord, fill this and back up again. Let's pour it out and fill up another one. Amen. I'd love it. I'd love to see those boys. They're my, they're my children. Now, JT or, or any of the rest of them don't have to bleed just like I do. They don't have to do that. As I told you this morning, I don't even agree with my wife or she don't agree with me. What if I went to the table and Junior got apple pie and I got cherry pie? Brother, we're both eating pie. We'd agree that. But, and we both preach the same gospel. His church discipline. You know, Peter and Paul had differences. Not in their doctrines, but the way Peter was behaving himself. 
They had a, a little difference in it. But it never separated them. They were brothers. Well, sure, we're going to have differences. Not differences. I disagree with the assemblies of God. I disagree with their systems. But there's a many assembly of God. Man is a precious brother. I disagree with the oneness doctrine. But there's a many of those men are precious man. I agree and disagree with the Baptists, with the Presbyterians, in their systems. But in there, there's genuine Christians. Amen. Somehow another this afternoon, I picked up a telegram. I missed it. A brother a Baptist preacher said he had been seeking for a long time to come to a place or get to a place where man respected God and instead of respecting one another. And a precious brother comes to this church and said, I'll take you to such a place. He was longing to get here. A Baptist. You see, they're scattered everywhere. I wouldn't agree with their system, but I certainly love the party. So don't say that about the brother. Now, in here, these gifts are got to be watched. No gift had to watch it. Satan can impersonate any gift. Look at these beetles now go to impersonate divine healing. Filthy, dirty, rotten, born out of hell. Amen. See? All right. Was Daniel the fourth man in the fiery furnace because he was the prophet in that age? No. It was Jesus. The fourth man was like the Son of God. I don't think it was a prophet because he was in the lion's den, but I wouldn't believe that Daniel was uh, in the fiery furnace. I, I can't hardly... Now, that, you could be right, but that's just my opinion. Brother Branham, in Genesis 6 and verse 12, God said that all flesh had corrupted his way. Does this have reference to divorce and marriage? If so, didn't Jesus have reference to the same thing when he said that well, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man will be revealed. In Matthew 24, verse 38 and 39. Brother Branham, will there be any children born during the millennium? Thousand years. Millennium, one thousand years. Reign of Christ here on earth. Or will there be any sign on earth, any sin, pardon me, on earth during that time? And will there be people on earth in Corporal bodies during that time. Now, I'll try to just run through them right quick. Now, in Genesis, uh, the 6th chapter, 12th verse, God said, All flesh had corrupted. Yeah, that was marriage, divorce, and everything else. The Bible said, As it was in the days of Noah, how they married and given marriage and so forth like that. That is one of the signs of the end time. Just one of the signs. Now, if that's all the world was doing, I couldn't call it the evidence of the end time. No more than I call speaking in tongues the evidence of the Holy Ghost. It is true. That there's supposed to come a time when marriage and divorce is just like it was in the days of Noah, but there's so many other things goes with it. It's just one of the signs. And speaking in tongues is one of the signs of the Holy Spirit, but not an infallible sign of the Holy Spirit. No more than just women, man marrying and divorcing and marrying again. That wouldn't be the only sign. If that's the only one it was, I couldn't call it that, see. Other things has to go with speaking in tongues or any other gift to make it God. Now, will children be born during the thousand years millennium reign? That's the question in my mind. And I told you the other day, I don't know. It looks a whole lot like it could be. It looks a whole lot like it couldn't be. I'm going to be as honest with you as I know how to be. I don't know to this time. If God ever reveals it, I will tell you. But wait, it has to come from God. You're my children. I wouldn't tell you. I don't know. Whether there will be or whether there will not be. I can't say. Or will there be sin on earth during that time? No, there will not be no sin on earth. Satan is bound. And will there be people on earth in corporal bodies during that time? Yes, sir. We will have our glorified body right here on earth, eating, drinking, building houses, and, and, and living just like we do now for a thousand years. It's, a, it's the honeymoon of the bride and groom. <clears throat> Brother Branham, what did Jesus mean in Matthew 12, verse 32, where Jesus said, Whosoever speaketh the word against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Please explain these verses of Scripture for me. Thank you. And um, it's got the um, um, man's name. He's a minister. All right. Brother, I'm a, you're a theologian. I'm not. But I'd like to say this, that Jesus said, Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. In other words... And I fought with the rest of Scripture. All men are sin shall be forgiven man, but blaspheme of the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto man. Blaspheme of the Holy Ghost is to make fun of, talk about, ridicule. Do something like that. It's when you cross the line between right and wrong. 
Now, if you see the Holy Spirit, for instance, what if the Holy Spirit would come down here and discern like it does? And what if that would be the Holy Ghost? And you didn't believe it was, and you went out and made fun of it and talked about it. I don't care what you ever do. You're finished. And you cannot do it. That proves right there that you're not of God. Because the seed of God remains in the man and he cannot sin. And what is sin? Unbelief. When he sees the Word made manifest, he'll believe it. And he can only say there's only one sin. Only one sin. How many knows that? That's unbelief. That's right. Committing adultery is not a sin. Smoking cigarettes, telling lies, swearing, that's not sin. That's attributes of unbelief. You do it because you're not a believer. That's right. So, see, there's only one sin, and that's unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. No matter what he does or nothing, he's condemned to start with. All right. Brother Branham, is it wrong for a young, unmarried, unmarried, didn't say what, to cut her, their hair? I imagine it's a woman. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's, it's wrong for any woman to cut her hair. That's uh, just a little short question. Are you, are you getting sleepy? No. Well, we'll, we'll hurry just as quick as we possibly can. I was trying to get that serpent seat so bad. Pray for our son. and That's a prayer request. I just picked these up and run. Just, Brother Branham, are women allowed to work in public affairs when they have a healthy husband and children? I am asking this question for someone else. Well... Uh, I, I, I don't know about that. I can't say. But I, I just have this feeling. Let me say this. I believe if I was a, a woman and I know that my husband was healthy and had a good job working, I believe it would be a, a great pleasure to me to stay home, take care of my children and make the, uh, 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 and take care of my children and raise them up and to love the Lord. And if I uh, had any time for my washing and things that I was going to do, I think I would teach my children how to serve the Lord. Now, if you've got a, a debt or something that you're trying to help your husband pay for or something that you have to do, at, uh, well, I think that's fine. If you try to help him and, and you live a lady, and I, I think it's hard. No man has got good understanding, wants his wife to get in a bunch where there's a bunch of vulgar, dirty man and things like that. But if a woman has to get in that, I think that she ought to, her husband ought to know that she's a genuine Christian that can be trusted, a trustworthy woman. But now, as, as to say that she shouldn't work, I, I don't know. She's no scripture to back that up. I'm just, I'm just passing that opinion. But I think if a woman wants to work and she wants to work, I'm certainly against women working in these offices where all these businessmen, they carry on, tell them dirty jokes and a nice clean woman sitting there and all these smutty, dirty things told around like that. I, I'm against that. I think you ought to come out from among such stuff as that. But now, if a woman can hold herself as a, as a real lady and trying to help her husband do something to meet some clothes for the kids to go to school or, or pay off a bill or something like that, she wants to work till that's over. Now, that's not the Lord because I don't have no scripture for this. I'm just saying that'd be my opinion. But otherwise... I wouldn't think just because she wants to work just to run around and have her own money to spend, run around and run to bar rooms or drink, smoke, and carry on. I don't think she should do it. I think she should stay home, try to be a lady, and take care of her house. If Jesus in a second... No, if... Jesus, if you in a second marriage where both parties are divorced, the... It, R -E -P -E repentance is repentance enough or do you have to end do you have to end your marriage relationship to be right if, if you're in a second marriage where both parties are divorced I think I've already answered that see yes already answered that and if we're both parties are I just uh, I, I wish we didn't have to go through these things, people. I got friends sitting right here out in this audience here that I know it just nearly kills me to say that. But I, I got to say it. See? And the world is in such a corruptible condition. Some poor little old woman make a mistake and marry some alcoholic and, and he turned that way or some poor man married some streetwalker and not know it. And then to be bound to that woman or man as long as they live, that's a horrible thing. 
Marriage is a sacred thing. Many times sinner kids run in and do those things and then they wonder what it's all about. I, it's, I believe if the Lord will permit me to explain this marriage and divorce the way it should be, I believe it will clear up a whole lot of that. It's all, we see, why can't we sell our house? Thank you. We, P.S. We have prayed and fasted and to sell it, yet no results. Well, now, brother or sister, they don't sign their name, but ever who it is, now you're trying to sell your property, and you've done what you, you want to sell it, and probably for buy some more or whatever you want to do, I don't know. If your objective is right, you're trying to buy a home, if you've got children or something like that, you want to get them a better home or something, I don't know what it's all about. But I'd say this, if you're trying to sell it and fasting and trying to sell it, then commit it to the Lord and forget about it, see? Because it might be that God... You might move in somewhere else and it might not be right. See? If you're a Christian and trust in the Lord, because you surely are, you wouldn't be fasting and praying. See? So I just committed to the Lord, saying, Lord, when your time for us to sell it, you'll send a buyer. And then just commit it to the Lord, take your hands off of it, and go ahead. I believe it'll work. I'm kind of speeding up here because I'm just running out of time. Brother Branham, is it wrong for a woman to curl her hair? I done went through that. Sure, I don't care. Let's keep it long. See? <laughs> I don't. And I know you. I don't mean that to be jokey with you girls. See, that's sincere. You, you, you want to know, and you're asking me. You got confidence in me, or you wouldn't be asking me that. Now I got confidence in you, sister. That what I tell you, I believe you do. I can't back that up with the scripture. If you want, if you haven't got pretty curly hair, and you're a woman, you want to look pretty for your husband, for your boyfriend, or something like that. I, I can't tell you about curling your hair, or, or what did they call it, tinting it. Or some, I, I have nothing to say about that. That's up to you. See, I, I, you, just betray, you just ask the Lord what to do. He, he'll tell you that. Because I'm trying to explain things by Scripture. See, please explain 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 12. Now that the perfect word is restored to the church, are, are these verses fulfilled? Now, I think I just went through that, didn't I? Yes. And when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. Paul said, Though I speak with tongue of man and angels, and I do all these things here, but when that which is perfect is come. Now, is there anything perfect but God? No, sir. Is God the perfect? In the beginning was a... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <laughs> the Word's still God. <laughs> See? All right. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part is done away with. Brother Bram, is it wrong to have a... Flat top haircut. I, su I suppose this is a man. I, I hope it is. <laughs> well, now, some women do that. Sure. I was going up on a bus one time. I was a state game warden here. Going up here, and I was sitting there, and a man was talking like that. Had a welder's cap on. I was just talking to him, and he was going ahead, smoking a cigarette. Had a welder's glasses pushed up like that. Was right up here around Sellersburg. And I was sitting there talking to that fellow, and he said something, and we all got to laugh, and I hit him on the leg. I said, boy, that, that really takes the cake, doesn't it? And I was sitting there like that, and a, directly, some, a woman sitting across there said, Say, Ruth, are you going to... <laughs> Had on overhauls, great big burly, just like a man sitting there smoking a cigarette and blowing it out her nose. I thought it was a man. Sound about dropping a suddenly torch and doing something, hitting on somebody's head and knock the watch card off and start laughing. I laughed too and slapped her right on the leg. <laughs> thinking it was a man. I didn't know the difference. You can't tell them. And the Bible said any woman that puts on a garment pertaining to a man, it's an abomination. There we are. No, brother, if you want a flat top hair tie, I tell you, you just wait to get about my age, you'll have one. <laughs> so, that's all right. I didn't mean that like that, buddy. Bless your heart. If you believe Brother Bram tell you the truth, I don't think God says anything about man. His, his covering is just as long as he cuts his hair. If he lets his hair grow down long like a woman, the Bible says it's a shame for a man to do that. But now, if as long as you got your hair and you're a little boy, and, and uh, I know I've said a whole lot about it, you Rickies with that flat top haircut and all like that and things like that, but I, I just say that. See, I don't, I don't think God cares how a man cuts his hair as long as he cuts it because his head is God. But a woman's head is a man. Therefore, she must... And if she cuts her hair, she dishonors her head. Then a dishonorable woman should be divorced and got away with. Is that right? So if a woman cuts her hair, 
She, uh, her husband has an absolutely Bible right to put her away in wrong living. A dishonorable person. How many knows that's the truth? That's what the Bible said. For she dishonors her head. No dishonorable woman should be lived with. Brother Branham, when Isaiah spoke to the daughters of Zion, or spoke to, I mean, she, I guess men spoke of, the daughters of Zion about the crispin pins, curling hair, and instead of a well-set hair baldness, instead of a... Um, will that apply to today, or is the old Bible of no effect, as some say? The old Bible is always in effect, and every word that God says is in effect. Yes, sir. Only thing it does from the new Bible to the old Bible is just magnified. Jesus said, You have heard him say, Thou shalt not commit adultery. He had to be in the act. But I say unto you, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. What great, outstanding things these are. Now I've got to close, friends. It's getting a little bit too late. Uh, that's too long. Or one. Let's see if I get something else. Let's see. Brother Branham, how should women... Oh, my. Wear their hair again. Just any way you want to. First Timothy 2.9. See? Let the women adore themselves in modest apparel. I want to I want to wear mine pleasing to God. God bless you, sister dear. Thank you. May God bless you. Pray for us. And the person signs her name. Sharon, sure, sis. God bless you. Wear it as long as it's long, sister. It's a little girl. God bless you, honey. It's okay. You go right ahead. After the bride is raptured. Will any of the foolish virgin be saved, or will they all be lost? No. See, everything will be finished for the Gentile church when the bride is taken from the earth. The Spirit of God leaves the earth. He that's filthy is filthy still. He that's righteous is righteous still. He that's holy is holy still. In other words, the sanctuary becomes smoky where the, the attorney stands to plead the case. Christ leaves the sanctuary. His day of meditorial is over. The rapture comes. He leaves from the sanctuary, goes forth, and takes the book of redemption and claims everything he redeemed. There's no more meditorial work. How many understands that? I got it on one of the seals, or one of the, yeah, the seals, I believe it was. And Christ comes forth to claim his meditorial work. Now, just a minute. Will the foolish virgin be saved? No. Whatever happens, she happens now. After that time, she's in the state. Now she will have to go through the tribulation period. And the reason of it is, is because she has rejected the atonement in its fullness. She is a believer, a professed believer, but she will have to go through the tribulation period. The Bible says that the rest of them, the dragon spurted water out of his mouth to go and make war. And what an hour that is. There's never been a time in history or that the nominal churches has become so hungry to find the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I, I speak for the Christian businessman. Constantly, it's Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, and all. Baptist by the hundreds. Church of Christ, Nazarenes, Pilgrim, Holman, Seventh-day Adventists. Every one of them flocking in, trying to find. See? Now, this is a striking thing. Please don't take it as a doctrine. But do you understand what the Scripture said would take place when that did? Time was over. Amen. For look, there were seven virgins or ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. And half of them had oil in their lamp, half of them didn't. That's the part of the body that's dead and the part that's alive. The five wise, when they, the cry come, behold, the bridegroom, they all trimmed, awoke and trimmed their lamps to go into the wedding supper. But when the foolish virgin said, give us some of your oil, our lamps has gone out. See? Give us of your oil. They said, not so. We just got enough for ourselves. Go buy it. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. When the proclamation went out, the degree, the bridegroom's coming. Everybody want to get right, right quick. Isn't that the hour? When the handwriting's on the wall? Oh, we want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We want this, that, or the other. But while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. The wise went in, and they were left outside where there will be weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth. I got such beautiful questions in here to go with that. Who was the man with a, a robe on and come in or didn't have the wedding garment on and all those questions are tied right in that. Should a person pay tithes to an individual or should a Christian uh, work? 
<laughs> sure he should. He's the one man that will work as a Christian. Pay tithes to an individual? It depends on who the individual is. That's right. In Hebrews 7, the first time tithings was talked about in, in a stand that we... Wait a minute, I believe a number two question. No, uh, no. For brother, I said two questions for Brother Bram. When, in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, when Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, met Melchizedek, he paid him a tithe. That was Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which is king of peace and king of righteousness, which was nobody but God himself. See? But when you pay tithings, really where you owe tithings is where you get your food. Bring ye all your tithings into my storehouse, saith the Lord. Is that right? And prove me, wherein saith God, that if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that you will not have room enough to receive it. I challenge any man or woman that's not a tithe pair to accept that. I could stand here till in the morning telling you just what happened when I seen that and what condition I was in. But it's as loyal as I ever could. I paid tithes. And when I took my own money from the church here or from the campaigns, I'd take more. I'd give a tenth then I'd give it out to the ministers and give the rest of it to ministers. Then when I couldn't do that, then the thing I did, I kept 10% and give God 90. And then when the law told me I couldn't do that, I'd have to take, and if I did, it's going to be charged to it. Then I had to take and bypass it into foreign missions and so forth. And then just take a wage out of that of $100 a week and I pay my tithes from that. Yes, sir, I believe in paying tithes. It's one of God's blessings that's proven to be a blessing. You say, that's of the Old Testament. It is of the New Testament, too. Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. Dear Brother Branham, if a baby is born of a, uh, out of wedlock, can this child ever be saved or go in the rapture? Saved? Why, sure. I believe the child could be. The child can't help what's been done. That is true. But I about going in the rapture... Uh, Saved, I'd say yes. But in the rapture, it's a predestinated seed that goes in the rapture. And I can't believe that adultery was a predestinated seed. You understand? Think? I believe the, people can, the baby can be saved. It has no, no rights of its own. It's an awful act and things. But now in the Old Testament, when a baby was born to bastard child, it could not even enter the congregation of the Lord for ten generations. Four hundred and something years, that curse was so bad. Just think of that. An uh, innocent baby, it's great, 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 great grandchildren. Just think, the baby's great, 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 ten great grandchildren could not even come in the congregation of God. Right. But you see, there was nothing there strong enough to forgive that sins. The blood of the Old Testament did not forgive sins, it covered sins. But the blood of Jesus Christ divorces it. That's different now. When the blood of Jesus Christ comes in, it's the difference. Brother Branham, we want to be close to your message as possible. Shall we move to Arizona or Jeffersonville? Suit yourself. Either one. I sure love you. I don't care where you go or what you do. But now as advice, I believe I'd come to Jeffersonville. If you're going to move anyhow, I'd come to Jeff. I believe I'm here more than I am in Arizona. That's fine. Brother Branham is... Is it too late to preach to sinners anymore? No. No, don't get that in your mind, brother. Keep on building on the house. Keep doing everything you can. Just keep on going until you're called away. See? Question number two. Should the save uh, separate themselves from sinners in worship? Should the save separate from Sinners to worship. I don't know exactly what you mean by that. If you mean sinners like um, out in the... You worship God everywhere. But I think that if we did, how are we going to have church? Because the sinners come right into the church and sit down by the side of the Christian. Don't never separate yourself from anything but sin. Not the sinner. Get the sinner if you can, but don't be takers of his sin. Should a saved wife refuse herself to her husband if he is a sinner? No, sir. No, sir, that's your husband. You're driving farther away from God than ever by doing that, see. That's right, brother, sister. You married him. He's yours. You're his. 
Brother Branham, what is the meaning of a annulment? Are people free to marry, or is this just another word for divorce? I would like some information on this. Sure, they're married. As long as they take that vow, they're married. It's like a boy. If a boy promises a girl to marry her under good faith, he's obligated to that girl. He's just as good as married her. The only thing the law does is give you a, a bill of rights to live together, to keep them being common law husband and wife. But when a man tells a woman, I will marry you, honey, I'll take you for my wife, will you take... He's married. Your vow is sacred. That's what marries you anyhow. It's not no preacher can marry you, no magistrate or nothing else. It's your own vow to God and to this man. When you promise, you are married. Look, you say, Brother Branham, is that... You say, you said you'd only answer that by the Bible. Did you want the Bible on it? So raise your hands if you want. Now, we've got about six or eight minutes, all right? Joseph, her husband, being a just man, her espoused husband already called her husband. Joseph, her husband, being a just man, was minded thee to put her away privately on this wise. But before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. See? And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Already married. He had already promised her. And, uh, and little lady, if you promise to marry that boy, you're obligated to do it. If you marry another after that obligation, you will from now on anyhow. You will be living in adultery. And notice the same thing to a boy promising to marry a woman. Don't you make your vow to anybody unless you mean to stick with it. Remember, there's the Bible for it. Joseph promised to marry Mary. And God said that that was... Your, read the Old Testament laws on that. See? The Old Testament law, if you promised to marry a woman and you married another and you was committing adultery and it throws you out of the camp, Yes, sir. You have to keep your vows when you promise a woman that she's a sacred little vessel and that's to bring child life into the world again. So when you promise her, you must marry her. Is it too late for jail services and such work for a testimony to try to save souls? Also, should one sell all they have now the Lord is coming so soon? How, how do you... I hope I haven't said anything that would cause you to believe such as that. Have I? If I have, forgive me. I don't mean... See, don't just presume those things. Keep right on going, preaching, having jail service, getting everybody... And don't look here. The Seventh-day Adventist, sure not long ago, about 50 or 60 years ago, I seen it in the Courage Journal paper, got it somewhere in a trunk, a great big piece of Courage Journal paper where they throw the old wings out, where when it's called Miller Nights before they become Seventh-day Adventists. And they had a whole big sheet in the Courier paper up here in Franklin, Kentucky, when they all sold their property and got, they set a certain date, proved it by the Scripture, Jesus is coming on that date, and went up there and got their harps and things and set up on top of the hill. The next morning, come down, the dew took all the feathers down, and they come down deflated. See, it's cults and things. Don't you believe that? Jesus might not come for a hundred years yet. I don't know when He's coming. No man knows when He's coming. But I'm going to try to keep on preaching and doing everything I can till He does come. If He isn't here today, I'll be looking for Him tomorrow. If He isn't here to, uh, this week, I'll be looking for Him next week. If He isn't here in the next 10 years and I live, I'll be looking for Him in the next 30 years. See? I'll still be looking. I don't know when He's coming, but I want to live true to His Word and true to His people and live like a Christian and wait for His coming. See? Keep on preaching jail services, getting everybody saved you can. I don't know when He's coming. Nobody does. But I'll say this one thing. This is what I'm trying to tell you, and I hope you don't try to put your own interpretation. Not bawling this person out. God bless you, brother, sister, whoever you are. It looked like it was somebody from out of town caught was on a, on a postcard, I think, from Denver, Colorado. And, um, uh, yeah, Pike Speaks, Colorado. So it might have been somebody sent it in by mail. But that, that's perfectly all right. They might get the tape. But let's remember, don't you change anything, only your ways from sin to righteousness. Just keep right on at your job, going right on just the same. All that understand that clearly say amen. amen. See, amen. do that now. Brother Branham, in Matthew 12, 40, it says, As Jonas was in three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How can it be 
that day that they say, the day that they say he was put in the tomb on Friday evening and rose Sunday morning, making it only uh, two nights and one day. Now, if you notice, it said, as it was, you see, in the days when Jonah was in the belly, three days and three nights. It's within three days and three nights. Within that three days and three nights, because you can't make the Scripture lie, the prophet said, I will not suffer my Holy One to see corruption, neither will I leave his soul in hell. And corruption sets in the human body in 72 hours, which is three days and three nights. Sometime within that three days and three nights that he must come forth from the grave. So being three days and three nights don't mean it has to be exactly that. It's sometime within that three days and three nights he had to come forth because the prophecy cannot be broken that uh, he could not see corruption. And it would have corrupted if he stayed exactly that time. Brother Branham, if a man has been married and divorced, isn't that awful? See, so many. Now, I'm not saying nothing against the people. Just that's on the people's mind. Sure, they're troubled. The rapture, people used to not think so much about that. It wasn't so much of it. But now it's just plastered the world. And the people read these things in the Scripture. And people elected out there is coming in to look at it. And they see it and they're sincere. They want to know. That's the reason I want to answer just with as much sense to it as I can give it to you. Has been married and divorced and then remarried of a woman who has also been married and divorced and then married to him. And these two can... Uh, uh, can uh, uh, yeah. uh, married in God's sight are they married in God's sight how can both or one of them be in the rapture I don't know <laughs> I couldn't tell you the question is can they be in the rapture divorced each one of them divorced each one of them has a living companion then they married again both of them married again and now one, this woman has a living husband. This man has a living wife. And now they've got children and so forth and want to come to God. Can they go in the rapture? That'll be up to the Heavenly Father. I couldn't answer that. See, I, I saw one thing. The Bible said that they shall be called an adulterer. And the Bible said also an adulterer will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's all I can say. I, I know that just kills me to say that, but I can't say but what the Word said. I must stay with that. I hope that that's all wrong. There is places in the Bible. I'm not advising you, please. Let me just give you a little scripture. Please. Please don't, 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 don't. If you're living happy with your husband, living happy with your wife, please remain that way, will you? Just, just from, because I told you that, don't, don't leave them little children without a home and things like that. God has made restitutions and places for people that, that, uh, that uh, did things wrong. You remember Jesus said, David, when he was hungry, he entered into the temple of God and ate the shoe bread, which is only lawful for the priest and is found blameless. The priest also blasphemed the Sabbath upon the Sabbath day and are found blameless and are greater than the Sabbath was here. See? There, uh, uh, let, let's just leave it up to God and go ahead and just live the way you... Just live for Christ now. Let's see. There might be a chance of you getting in. Don't make two wrongs on ever right and one. Just go on and live the way you are. If you're, if you're happy together, you might have had the wrong companion. I'll say this one thing. If you got the wrong companion in this life, in this life, you'll never have it in the other one. All wrongs will be made right. Will all born again believers go in the rapture? No. Just the remnant. Just the remnant. Not all born again believers. The Bible said, And the rest of the dead live not for a thousand years, and then is raised up and separated the sheep from the goats. Not all born again will go in the, according to the Scripture. What is the evidence that a person is really filled with the Holy Ghost? John fourteen twenty six. He will, when the Holy Ghost has come, see, He will show you things to come, see. He'll be he'll perfect it. Man maids won't do it, and he is the Word. When he, the Holy Ghost, has come, he will identify himself in you with the Scripture, and that is the true sign that the Holy Spirit is in you because it is the Word. Now look, what if you spoke with tongues? I just want to ask you that. Jesus said when the Holy Ghost come, what he would do. And what if you spoke with tongues, jumped up and down, shouted and everything else, and then come to the Word 
And I tell you, the baptism of proved to you by the Scripture as I have that the baptism using the title of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is absolutely a misunderstanding in the Scripture. Nobody was ever baptized like that, and you go ahead and hang with it anyhow. Could you tell me the Holy Spirit in you would do a thing like that? How can it deny its own word? When I show you what's supposed to take place in this day, how that the Son of Man is to reveal Himself and what He's to do and all these scriptures that's been out, and then see Him come right down and identify it, and you hang right on to a denomination and say that you're born again? Could you make sense out of that? Could I tell my wife I love her and, and have a date with another woman and run around? And then tell her from my heart I love her? Do you think that'd be true love? Could she tell me she loves me and while I'm gone away, her run around with some other man? That's exactly what Israel done to... You know the Bible there, how he said, talk, Israel said, you have set your limbs apart and taken in every man that come by. You've played the part of hoarding with me and I'll put you away in divorce. Exactly what is that? You're committing adultery against your own body. And when a woman goes out and lives with another man or a man with another woman when they're married to him, they are defiling their own flesh. And when a person says that he is a Christian and will absolutely deny the Scripture being right, he's committing adultery against the body that he claims to be in. So it's a mark of Antichrist. So much that would deceive the elected if possible. Brother Branham, is it all right for a young child to wear slacks and shorts? How young? (laughs) You let... You'd be the judge of that if you're a Christian, a little girl or a little bitty kid, I imagine. I don't know. I, only thing I know, the Bible says it's an abomination for a woman to wear a garment that as pertains to a man. See, a woman. Didn't say the child. But now, I just, you suit yourself about that. I, for my part, I see nothing wrong with a little bitty kid, a little bitty girl, four or five years old, with a, when they're little fellows, you know how I mean, they run around out there in the yard. If she's wearing the, what you call slacks or whatever, a little bitty kid, I, I don't see nothing wrong with it. But maybe, see, I'm just telling you what the Word says. It's an abomination for a woman to wear a garment that pertains to a man. Where are we together, ourselves together, and you, you said together yourselves on the trumpets. I believe, partner, sister, whoever it is, you're, you're wrong there. I never said gather yourselves on the trumpets. I said Israel gathered on the trumpets. Not the Gentile bride. No, no. The trumpets, the sounding of the seven trumpets was to gather Israel. How many knows that from all over the... Yeah, not the... No, no, uh-uh. No, not, uh, not, not Israel. Uh, so uh, it's not... Uh, that We don't gather on the trumpets with the, at, uh, the bride doesn't. The trumpets comes after the Feast of Pentecost, see, and the rapture comes. And that, not to this question now. Uh, Brother Branham, if you have time, please explain Matthew 10, 41. I would like to know what is a prophet's reward. Now, Jesus said, Whosoever receive a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet's reward. A prophet's reward is to be a friend with a prophet. He who ever sees a righteous man in the name of a righteous man receives a righteous man's reward. Is that right? And if they want to know what a prophet's reward is, is to be a friend to the prophet. See? That's a reward. He's your friend. Like the Shunammite woman. It might come in handy sometime. See? It did with her. See? Watch God's servants. Oh, my. Now we're, I, I just must close. And friend, I, I hate to do it, but just look here. Just look what... Hundreds... No. Well, I know, but the, I, I, I love you saying that, but I'm thinking of these poor people driving hundreds of miles yet tonight. My, I'm just, there's so many. In there. I, Brother Ben, I would like to know about the millennium. Is it after the marriage supper, or, or is it on earth all about it? I do, don't understand about it. Well, brother or sister, it's hard for me to understand it myself. But the only thing I can say is this, that the marriage supper comes before the millennium. I see somebody, I know somewhere in here has got a question on that, that said, Brother Branham, um, you're, you're wrong on the 70 weeks of Daniel. There will still be 70 weeks. 
No, the Messiah was to come and prophesy, and in the midst of the 70 weeks, 70 weeks, which is seven years, he was to, he was to be cut off from among the living and made a sacrifice. How many remembers that? Amen. All right. How many years then did Jesus preach the Messiah? Three and a half. Then there's still three and a half determined. And Revelations, the 11th chapter, these two prophets, they prophesy 1,203 score days, three and one half years. Still promised to Israel when their Gentile bride is gone. How many understands that now? All right. All right. Um, this is a... I have a lunch counter and serve high school children for the most part since coming into the light. I have taken uh, the pinball machine and uh, the jute box, I guess, J-box, out uh, the youngsters uh, do smoke, and they want the rock and roll music on the on the radio. I open uh, only about four hours a day. I do not I do not uphold smoking or drinking, but I am worried in holding the place. You know, <laughs> that's a problem. See, the thing of it is that you are, you are, maybe have to make a living, but you know what that would do for me? That make me so nervous I couldn't, I, I, that, you might be able to put up with it. But that little bunch of Rickies in there carrying on like that, and Rick Eddas, I'd, I'd, <laughs> it'd run me wild, see? And I tell you, I, I, if it would be mine, I know what I'd do. I'd say, you stop that or get out of here. I'd run a right kind of place or not run at all. But you, if you have to do it for a living, I don't want to disregard you, brother or sister. I, I know it's hard to say these things, but that, that just, it isn't right, you see, because it looked like it kind of like someone said this morning about our women wearing their dresses so short, our older women was a bad example to the young ladies. I think that's right, too, you see. And I think that same thing, when they see you in there where all this smoking and carrying on is and know your testimony and all this cursing and and rallying around them, little children like that, and them carrying on like that, and you saying nothing about it, it's a bad thing on your testimony. You do whatever the Lord leads you. I pray that God will lead you to the right way. If uh, S A N D standing in line to get into church is going to be only a memory, what is going to happen if we are not going through the tribulation? Are we to be be seen same su some suffering if we're not to see see I'm, this question is probably at this I'm trying to hurry I, I, I oughtn't to do this or to lay these back because there's a place you could stay on an hour see and it, just tear it down I'll, I'll stop look the people are wanting to say that thinking that they the church is going to hit the tribulation see it won't it can't See, because it's already redeemed. Now the church, the, the nominal believers like Lot, he's going through the tribulation period. See, and be saved as if it was before. Noah went through the tribulation period, carried above it, come out with Ham who polluted the earth again. <coughs> See, Lot came out. His own daughters slept with him and had children by his own daughters. See? But Abraham brought forth the royal seed. Brought forth the seed of the promise. Enoch went to glory in the rapture, just took a walk and went home and never went through the tribulation period. You see? There you are. See, it does not, the Bible cannot by a type, and the types can't fail. See? It does not Predict that the bride, now the church will go through the tribulation period. Now the people say, what about the early saints? That was a changing of the dispensations. That was under persecution, which if you were sure to hear the church ages and to see how they went out into that darkness and had to do that, then that shows where they had to take that persecution because each one of the church ages and everything began to show that they went darker and darker until they finally went to a complete place that they denied his name and picked up another name that they lived and were dead. Sardis. 
And then he come on out to Tyra and Sardis and then come out, then begin to come out to Philadelphia and so forth. And then come to the time of the calling out of the bride, which was to escape all the damnation. It counted worthy to escape all this damnation and wrath that's to come up on the earth. That you might be counted worthy to escape it. Not go through it, escape it. Amen. See? Do you understand now, everybody? See? The church, the lukewarm, the anything outside of the elected bride will go through the tribulation period. They will not raise in the first resurrection. The rest of the dead live not for a thousand years. Just the foreordained, predestinated, elected bride. God's own elections. Who is it, Brother Branham? I don't know. I can't tell you who it is. But I know it's going to be there because the Lord said they would. See, they are the ones that will go up from the tribulation. But the rest of them will go through the tribulation, go down, and everything will be killed before the millennium. Then the, the righteous shall come out in the millennium and live a thousand years. And after the thousand years, then the great white throne judgment comes. And then the dead, both right and wrong, is raised. And the books are open, and the book of life is open. And the saints, the wife and the husband, set and judge the world. And there it comes to pass the same, and he'll judge all nations with a rod of iron. All nations shall stand before him there. And he'll judge them with a rod of iron, and he'll separate the sheep from the goats, and say to the goats, Depart, and the sheep's come, ye blessed of my father. Now, then there will be a camp meeting of the saints upon the breath of the earth. And Satan is loosed out of his prison and goes to make war again with the saints. Just exactly what he done in glory to begin with. And then God rains fire and brimstone out of the heavens and the whole earth is r removed like it. Just burn up and destroy it. And there's no more sea, no more water, no more nothing left on the earth. Volcanical spray and burst and blow and the whole thing. And I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the first heavens and first earth was passed away and there was no more sea. I, John, saw the holy city descending from God out of heaven as a bride adored for her husband. Remember it? And in this bride, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and God shall dwell with them upon this pyramid-shaped city 1,500 square miles. And at the top of the city, there will be a light. Amen. Oh, that city of Mount Zion. Amen. As a stranger, yet I love it still. Hallelujah. I'll meet you in the Middle Ages when I reach that city on the hill. On top of Mount Zion will set the Lamb, and the city will need no light, for the Lamb is the light thereof. And above the Lamb will be the Father, which is the Logos, God, the great light, the eternal light. That will shine just above the throne. And Jesus will not be on His Father's throne. He will be on His throne. Amen. And the Father will hover over the Son. Which the Father and Son will be one. And while they are yet speaking, I'll answer. Before they can think, I'm thinking for them. <laughs> That's right. And Jesus will commit a perfect, perfect age to a... The perfect living God that He has redeemed and give over to the Father. Is that right? We'll turn to God, the Father, which is Spirit. Not a man. Spirit. All nature of goodness gathered together. That's God. And in goodness, out of thing perverted from good is evil. That's Satan's kingdom. All good belongs to God. All evil belongs. And then God became material in a man called Jesus Christ, which was His Son. This son gave his life that he might bring other sons, that God might become tangible, working in all and all. And that day you'll know that I'm in the Father, the Father in me, I in you, and you in me. Amen. Oh, brother, that'll be a real day. You won't have George, John Wagner and Birmingham to hear the message. <laughs> the message will be right with us that morning. Amen. Oh, it'll be, a, it'll be a wonderful, wonderful time. Amen. We're looking for that day. God hasten it to come. That great city sitting there. I see, it will not, 
You think 1,500 miles high? That's what the Bible said. Now, it will not be 1,500 miles right straight up like that. See, we have another geographic measure that all sides are equal. That's a pyramid. See? And the city will start probably about a 60 degree. And if it starts 1,500 miles of that, just think how high that will be, but how long it will take to be there. You hardly know you're walking up the hill. For 1,500 miles high at a 60 degree, you're just about like this. See? And the city's all on this hill. And it's just as high as it is long. It's just as long as it is wide. The height by the depth by the breadth. It's equal. All the walls are equal. A pyramid has four walls. And each four walls will be... Now the walls around the city will be, uh, be 216 feet tall. 144 cubics. And each one of them is a stone. Just think of that city, friends. Oh, my. What, what do we set here in this hot place? Why do we do these things? Why do we drive like that? Why do we, why do we toil? It's worth every inch of the way. All the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. That's right. Oh, what a time that'll be. And there Jesus will sit on the throne. And out from under the throne will flow the river of life, trickling down these four walls into little chasms and into little branches and come form up a river. Down through by the city, it'll go right down through the streets like that. And on each side stands the trees of life that'll bear a uh, change of fruit every, every 30 days. Oh, what a city. And remember, God the Creator that created the heavens and earth is in glory right now preparing that city. Amen. Abraham looked for it. He left his home. He separated everything that was dear to him. And looking for why he was a prophet. And being a prophet, he was connected with the Spirit and part of the Spirit. And something told him within him, there is a city. And he started looking for it. He said, I'm a pilgrim, a stranger. I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. He knew that city was somewhere. Oh, my. And I believe that right on the grounds where he looked for it, right there in Palestine, there's where it'll raise up. For it's on Mount Zion. That's where she'll be. Look where she'll stretch out into the, into the sea from sea to sea. Think of that 1,500-mile city sitting out there on the mountains of the Lord. <laughs> oh, that'd be wonderful. And the lion and the lamb shall lay down together. The lion will eat straw like the bullock, and the bear will be gentle, and the wolf will be tame. <laughs> what a time it will be. Nothing shall hurt or destroy. Everything will be in peace and love. There will be no more old age. There will be no more sickness, no more dying. Folks, this is not some Santa Claus story, some mythical something. It's written in the Word, and never has the Word failed. And to think of the very promise of not back in a Bible day, but in this day, the day that God, today, not one iota has ever failed of His Word. Well, oh, I'm bound for that city. I love it, don't you? No, I, a brother, sister, it's, it's 20 after 9. I know I got some friends here from way down in Kentucky. I know I got friends here from different parts of the country. If you want to stay all night, I'll pay for your room. I told you you had dinner waiting for you and pay for your motel if you want to stay. And the only thing you have to do is see him back there and I'll sure do it. I'll do anything I can to help you. I love you. I don't mean to answer these questions maybe sometimes contrary. If you don't believe it, that's perfectly all right. I want you to love me just the same because God knows I do you that way. I only answer these questions the best of mine. I might have been wrong in some of them, friends. But it wasn't willfully wrong. If I'd had about six or eight questions so I could just stay right with them and just explain it right down. But I, instead of running all through them now, I have a few of them about marriage and divorce. I just had thought I'd answer a few of them. I couldn't find them more laying here picking them up. But I got some very important questions here. Very important questions. I want to answer them for you if I can. Now, if you living around here close, call Billy Wednesday. I'll know by then whether I'll be back. I'll pray this week, but I've got a lot of private interviews or oh, a pile about like that. 
And I got nearly that many in Arizona to make one of these days when I can. And it's people who are really sick. Some of them have got problems and they just don't know what to do. Husbands and wife with problems. And some of these sure had to be turned to private interviews because I could not read it right out what the people said in here about their marriage affair and things like that. And I had Billy just to go back and find out who they are and, and call them and tell them we'll just put them on interview so I can talk to them. I'm very serious and it's questions that should be answered. I'm here to try to help you because I love you. You're my children that I have begotten to Christ. I claim every one of you. I claim you tonight. I claim you all the time. I always claim you. And that is my brother and sister. You're my children. I, I'm your father in the gospel. Not father as it would be a priest. I'm, I'm your father in the gospel, as Paul said there. I have begotten you to Christ, and I, I espouse you to Christ. That's engage you to Christ as a chaste virgin. Don't let me down. Don't let me down. You stay a chaste virgin. How will I do it, Brother Branham? Stay right with the Word. Live clean and pure. Have nothing to do with the things of the world. If the love of it's in your heart, say, Oh, Jesus, please take that away from me. I don't want to be like that. I don't mean just to be some person that's uh, saying this. Uh, I mean to be a genuine believer. Believe Jesus Christ and live for Him every day. Don't do no evil. Now, a lot of times I speak of Calvinistic belief. Now, don't think that that lets you loose to do anything you want to. The fellow the other day, I said, did you go to church? He said, I went hunting. The man's wife come to me. And she was coming from the laundry mat on Sunday. And I said, uh, why didn't you go to church? She said, I've done my washing. I said, you shouldn't have done that. Well, she said... I'm not an old legalist. I said, but I thought you were a Christian. See? I said, did you know you're putting a stumbling block in somebody's way? See? I said, I, I, I believe this. I don't have to do those things. I'm not a legalist. But look, my brother, sister. Look here. Paul said, if eating meat puts a stumbling block in my brother's way, I'll eat no more meat as long as the world stands. And I think it'd be a whole lot better. Now, you say, Brother Bram, you hunt. Did you ever hunt on Sunday? Let me tell you something. Now, I'm not patting myself to the back of this. But I'm, I'm not a Sabbatarian now. I believe the Holy Spirit is our Sabbath. I believe that. But I believe we should honor that resurrection as a memorial. That's a memorial. That I, if you honor any day, honor that resurrection. Now, there's no law on keeping any certain day because you enter into the Sabbath, the peace when you enter into Him. Uh, I've got that question here to answer pretty soon, anyhow, if the Lord willing, about what is the Sabbath day. And I'll explain it, God willing. And now, notice, remember this. See, when I was a little boy, right up here where Ike's lived on the road, I was about 14 years old. I was trapping for a living. The only thing I had to help get bread in our house was catching skunks, muskrats, possums. I loved trapping. And I had to do it. I'd go to school smelling like a skunk. And I, I had only one pair of clothes, and that's all I could wear. That's all I had. Mom would take them off and wash them, put them back on. And that's how I went to school. Little boy. But I stand up there one night, I said, I got them traps set up there around Wathens up above that. I leave every morning by 2 o'clock with a lantern to run these traps and get back in time to go to school. I catch a rabbit, I got 15 cents out of it. I get a box of shells out of that, and maybe that... Kill three or four rabbits. What we didn't have to make some biscuits and rabbits while uh, gravy for supper, I'd sell the other and maybe get enough to get some bread or some meal or some flour to make gravy with. I don't know where you had to live like that or not. I'd set trot lines on the river, go down and get them fish and sell them for 10 cents a pound, set my trot lines. I didn't have no boat. I'd swim out with a log, get in the river and it's still cold, put my bucket of bait out here on the log and to paddle and paddle out there. I got my naked potty in the river and run this, have me a string on this side, tie my fish up, I'm old catfish fitting me in the lake going along like that and put my bait on. But look, a many a night have I went out in that river at 11 o'clock and shake every piece of bait off that line. If I couldn't catch enough in six days, I didn't want the one to come on the seventh. I stood there in the rain one night. I can just see myself yet standing leaning against. I was a sinner. I stand leaning against the post like it's the door. Oh, it was pouring down rain. Pretty near 11 o'clock, I said, I'll be late tonight. But I'm going and spring every one of those traps. I won't catch him on the Sabbath. I said, I won't, I, I won't set them traps. God honored that. 
I remember the time when I always wanted, I always, all my life, wanted to be a hunter. My grandfather was, you know, my grandmother come off the reservations. She drawed a pension. I just love outdoors. Now, I remember I always wanted, I, I just wanted all my life, thought if I could ever get enough money that I could own a thirty thirty rifle, if I could ever do it. Then I'd get a bunch of traps. I'd go to the mountains. I'd let the rest of the world go by. I thought maybe sometime if I'll take my twenty two and practice to be a good shot, some hunter sometime will want me to go along. If I get to be a pretty good shot, he'll let me go along for his protection. I'll get to go hunting. I look hanging on my walls, and the best rifles that money can buy hangs there. So I can loan people rifles to go hunting. He lets me go into the mountains and preach to some of the best guides there is in the world. Takes me hunting free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Uh, even this morning, an old deer hunter here somewhere with a thirty-five Remington. I didn't really need the rifle, but he put his arm around me and said, he's getting too old to hunt. I want to give him my rifle. I thought of that when I was a little boy. How if I'd ever thought I'd owned a rifle like that? Oh, my, what it would have been. And now I just think, hanging there on my wall, fine rifles, places to go hunting, I remember going out and the boys would buy ice cream cone. And sometimes some of them would have an extra nickel and they'd buy me one. My, I couldn't buy them one back. I thought, if I, and they sometimes used to buy these old, what we call mudlark hamburgers. Don't know where y'all remember enough, some of you old timers. You get it for a nickel, a whole lot of fried onions with it. Oh, I love those things. A little kid we didn't have, just cornbread and molasses, you know how it is to eat. Now, somebody buy me one of them hamburgers, that, boy, I'd lick my fingers where I held it. It was, it was, it tastes so good. And I thought, boy, that man, if I could only buy him a hamburger. And now I can buy a church their supper. I remember all those things and where did it come from? The grace of God. Hallelujah. Nothing that I did. I remember going down the street here and I talked to somebody. My father, you all know it, he drank, he made whiskey. And, I, and nobody had nothing to do with me. I'd go down the street and try to talk to man. I still meet that man today. Try to talk to somebody. If there's nobody else to talk to, they'd stand, yeah, mm-hmm. See, I was a Branham. So I'd feel real bad and turn around and walk away. I thought, I'm not guilty of that. I didn't do what my daddy did. I never drank in my life. Why do I have to stand that? Now I was telling the wife here not long ago, I almost have to stay out of town. God has done been good to me. I thought over there where he told Nathan, sitting there one time, Nathan, David said, Is it right for me to live in a house of cedar, the ark of my God under a tent out there coming? He, Nathan, the prophet, said, David, do all's in your heart because God's with you. The prophet made a mistake, not willingly. That night the Lord comes to the prophet and said, Go tell my servant David. I took him from that sheep coat, herding them few sheep out there. And I'll give him a name like great man that's in the earth. Never said he'd give him the greatest name. He just give him a name like great man that was in the earth. I've done all these things for you, David. I've cut off your enemies wherever you went. I've been beside you. I've never failed you. And I won't fail you. But I can't let you build a city. I thought of that, of a place now where God has helped me and let me know great man. Let me go around the world and people from around the world calling to come pray for them and sick people and wanting a few minutes with you where... Just a few years ago, they wouldn't even turn their turn their head to see me on the street. Wow. Now the businessman prosper by the people that are bring into the city and have here through their food and their motel bills and things like that, uh, going to the motels and around in the city and things like that. And people who pump and didn't love me at all, nobody had any use for me. And now, uh, by the help of God, I believe it. I'm directing the bride of Jesus Christ. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Where did it come from? My education? I have none. Where did it come from? My personality? I have none. Did it come from my knowing of theology? I know none. What did it come to? The grace of God that saved me. It's grace that taught my heart to fear. It's grace my fears relieve. How happy did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. It's grace that brought me safe thus far. It's grace will take me on. And when we've been there in that city 10,000 years, it's brighter than the sun. We'll have no less time to sing His praise than when we first begun. 
Oh, how I love Jesus. That beautiful name that saved me when I was a, a sinner, that healed me when I was sick, that gives me the promise of a home in that city. I got a home in that rock. Nothing else matters now but to get all of God's children together and say, let's go. The hour, the midnight is striking. It's later than we think. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the closing of a perfect day. As we would stand on the mountaintop and watch the sun when the red streaks come up across the great western mountain genre, when the great eye closes itself, the birds begin to make their way to the nest. It's coming night. We've seen another great spiritual day when the Holy Spirit has been helping us to answer these questions. Now we're going to our nest, Lord. Take care of us. Don't let nothing strike us, Lord. Keep us from the serpents of the night and the evil. May God be near us at all times, protecting us and helping us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll bless each and every one that's been in the meeting. Those who could not be all that hears the tapes, may the questions not be too strong. And if I've made a mistake, Lord, you know my heart, I didn't mean to. I pray, God, if there's anything wrong, that you'll never... Never let it go on. May the tape stop. Don't let me deceive anybody, Lord. Let me be your true servant. For that's my whole heart's desire. Whether I live or die, whether I tarry or whether I go on, whether I sleep or whether I'm awake when he comes, it doesn't matter to me, Father. Thy will be done. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. And at the last days he'll stand up on this earth. Though if the skin worms has destroyed this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That was the prophet Job when he seen the coming of the Lord. Lord, today as your servants, we look forward and see your coming. So it doesn't matter to us, Lord, when, how, where. We only want to please you. We are in your hands. Keep us, Lord, until the sun's up. Grant it. And then we'll all march up to Zion or that city where the Lamb is the light. My dear little children here, Lord, that I have begotten to you through the bonds of the Bible. They are the fruit of this word. They love me and I love them. And I know that you love all of us. We pray, God, that you'll so impregnate us with thy word that we can see only him. Grant it, Lord. May we be so full of his word that the Spirit can use us anywhere at any place to manifest any word that he has promised. Grant that to all of us. Here upon this audience, share these. My brother Jackson returns now way back down into South Africa. Go with him and his wife. Be with them, Lord. Guide them on their journey. Here's Brother Lee Vale writing, putting every word that I say down, trying to make the book. Oh, God, help Brother Vale and Sister Vale. Here's these brothers from down in, in Arkansas and and uh, the Martin brothers and, uh, and all these other brothers. I pray that you'll be with each and every one of them. Be with Brother Neville, Brother Caps, Brother Ruddle, Brother Jackson. All oh, oh God, there's so many. They come from Georgia, from Alabama, and across the state and around the world. We think of the song, Oh, they come from the east and west. They come from the lands afar to feast with our king, to dine as his guest. He's invited them to partake of himself. How blessed these pilgrims are, beholding his hallowed face aglow with love divine, blessed partakers of his grace as gems in his crown to shine. Oh, God, may we so shine as gems in his crown that others might see and long to serve him. Grant it, Lord. Protect him along the road. Bless everyone. Father, at your appointed time, I am your servant. If you want me to continue these next week or to take those interviews, reveal to me, Lord, and let me know between now and Wednesday so that we can understand. Grant it, Father, so that people can come. And I pray this blessing that you help us and meet with us again here at our next meeting time. Be with Brother Neville and these men who are bringing the word way down in Texas and out in Arkansas and different places. Just be with them, Father. 
Brother Perry Green and all the group there and just be with all them, Lord. They're your little children. Everywhere around the world, they're waiting for your coming. Help us, Father. We pray as we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, use us. Amen. I like that song that come from the east and west. How many knows it? I don't know as I know it, but I think I know a verse. You might pick it up, sister. I don't know when you get Oh, they come from the east and west. They come from the land afar to feast with our king, to dine as his guest. How blessed these pilgrims are, all beholding his hallowed face, a glow with love divine. Bless partakers of his grace as gems in his crown to shine. Oh, Jesus is coming soon. Our trials will then be o'er. Oh, what if our Lord this moment should come for those who are free from sin? Oh, then would it bring you joy, our sorrow and deep despair. When the Lord in glory comes, we'll meet Him up in the air. You like that? Let's try it again. Oh, they'll come from the east and west. Oh, they come from the land afar. To feast with our King, to dine as His guest. How blessed these pilgrims are, beholding His hallowed face, a glow with love divine. Oh, bless partakers of His grace as gems in His crown to shine. Oh, Jesus is coming soon. Our trials will then be o'er. Oh, what if our Lord this moment should come for those who are free from sin? Oh, then would it bring you joy or sorrow and deep despair? When our Lord in glory comes, we'll meet Him up in the air. How many wants to meet Him up there? Oh, my. Oh, Jesus is coming. Just close your eyes. Imagine hearing the trumpet sound. Our troubles will then be old. Oh, what if our Lord this moment should come for those who are free from sin. Oh, then would it bring you joy, our sorrow and deep despair, when our Lord in glory come, we'll meet Him up in the air. You like that? Pat? Be of a good courage. It's going to break day for you one of these mornings. I didn't see just where it went, but it looked good. Amen. You've been a long, long time, brother. It'll come back. And like bread up on the water, we'll return to you someday. <laughs> All right. Oh, you love him. My faith looks up to thee. Thou Lamb of Calvary, O Savior divine, now hear me while I pray, take all my sins away.
this dark maze I tread and griefs around me spread be thou my guide bid darkness turn today a wide sorrow fears away oh let me from this day be holy don't you love that my faith looks up to thee Thou Lamb of Calvary, O Savior divine, now hear me while I pray, take all my sin away. straight from the sign bless be the time that burned oh my our heart in Christian love the Fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayer. Our fears, our hopes, our aims, our one, our comforts, and our cares. But when we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to me. Sister Wilson, you remember about 33 or 35 years ago in a little house meeting, we'd hold one another's hands. I know you remember that. Oh, let's just reach over now and take somebody by hand. Blessed be the light that lies our in Christian love. The inward pain but we 
shall still be joined in heart and hope to be again. Do you love one another? Little children, love one another. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet, till we meet, till we Isn't he wonderful? Hallelujah. You love one another? Hallelujah. Reach around, say something one day, say, God bless you, brother. Bless you, sister. They're listening at us tonight across the river, Honor Amen. Sister Wilson. Hallelujah. I can see old brother Seward walking the floor, clapping his hands. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I seen our brother back there with a beard on his face, raise up his hands, praising God. I thought of Brother Ryan, how he used to sit right along there in the old tabernacle with his beard long like that. He's listening tonight across the portals of glory. Hallelujah. Your old saint. Praise the Lord. Isn't he wonderful? Yes. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you. Oh, take it everywhere you go, precious name. Oh, how sweet. Oh, Father. The name of Jesus with you. What for? As a shield from every snare. What happens? When temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name. Precious name. Oh, how sweet. For the interviews, Billy said, check with him between now and Wednesday for interviews, or from Wednesday on until Saturday for the coming interviews, whether if we don't have the meetings after Wednesday, check with him, you who have interviews. Some of you don't know how to get a hold of you, so he'll, all it wants the interviews now, check with Billy. You love him? Amen. All right. Now, till we meet, God bless you. We want to bow our heads. And I'm going to ask my good, loyal friend who's going across the sea now to way down in Africa where I once missionary there in the name of the Lord, Brother Sidney Jackson, he and his wife. We've been very happy to have them with us for these last few services, how God has blessed him. And I'm going to ask Brother Sidney Jackson if he'll dismiss this audience in prayer. Brother Jackson, if you will. Hallelujah.